In the agonizing build-up to Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, I think it's time to embrace Indiana Jones while it still hasn't been ruined. I previously did a video defending Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. A lot of criticisms people make towards it can also apply to other indie movies. Like for example, this one guy in my comment section went on a rant about how Crystal Skull is racist for overgeneralizing cultures, ignoring that Temple of Doom exists. Someone else made a good point when they said that Crystal Skull was just a movie released at the wrong time. If Temple of Doom and Crystal Skull swapped with each other, the George Lucas haters would be hating on Temple of Doom instead. But since Temple of Doom was a movie release when they were kids, that's why they like it. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is a good movie. I watched it on repeat, just like the other films and I loved it. I'm sick of the hatred towards Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Hopefully that will change with the Dial of Destiny coming out, but we shouldn't get to that point in the first place. So for this series, I'm going to review the original trilogy, Raiders, Temple of Doom, and Last Crusade. I'm going to critique all three of these films, give my take on them, and so on and so forth. We should embrace the Indiana Jones franchise while it's still good. I also wanted to talk about the Indiana Jones Expanded Universe at some point, but before that, I should talk about the mainstream stuff first. So some background. The character that would become Indiana Jones was conceptualized by our Lord and Savior George Lucas, who thought up of him as an American competitor to James Bond of sorts. The character's original name was Indiana Smith, but when discussing the idea to Spielberg, he didn't like the name Smith, so George proposed Jones as an alternate surname. Spielberg came on to direct, albeit reluctantly. One of the candidates to play Indiana Jones was Tom Selleck, but due to being really busy with the show Magnum P.I., Spielberg suggested bringing Harrison Ford on. Because of his great performance with Han Solo in A New Hope, and the production stuff he saw with The Empire Strikes Back, George Lucas was against the idea for a fair reason. He didn't want to cast the same actor for different roles all the time, but he eventually agreed. Harrison Ford was a great choice for Indiana Jones. It was also a lucky choice for Harrison Ford personally, because he hates Han Solo, but has a soft spot for Indiana Jones. So luckily for him, one of the two iconic characters he played is someone he likes, which is something to balance out Han Solo, a character he doesn't like. That's more you can say for Alec Guinness as an example. Indiana Jones was heavily inspired by 1930s adventure serials, in which the Nazis were commonly the bad guys. I'm saying the word like that because YouTube doesn't like how it's actually pronounced. So without further ado, let's get into Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And yes, that's its name. Simply calling it Raiders of the Lost Ark was made before Indy became a franchise. The correct full name is Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Nicknaming it Raiders is fine, but just make sure to get the modern name correct. I say this when I'm annoyed when this movie is always listed the wrong way. It reminds me of the people who still call Episode 4 A New Hope simply Star Wars. It's outdated as hell. Also, I feel I should address something from a previous video. I was sick of people using Lawrence Kasdan as an excuse to discredit George Lucas for his own work. That's why I wanted to set the record straight. Lawrence Kasdan was mostly useless when it came to Star Wars. The best thing he came up with was Yoda's backwards talking. He also helped George structure parts of Return of the Jedi, I guess, but he also came up with a lot of terrible ideas. Link to the video in the description. The only thing that can go against my video is the movie we're talking about today. Lawrence Kasdan wrote the script based on George's and Spielberg's outlines, so I guess that's credit where it's due, but that's really his only contribution to anything as far as I can tell. Lawrence Kasdan in terms of Star Wars was incredibly awful when it came to coming up with his own ideas, in which he and J.J. Abrams stole from George in The Force Awakens, and he came up with the most bizarre origin story for Han Solo. Also, it's weird that Kazan didn't return for Temple of Doom or Last Crusade. Also, also, remember that George Lucas came up with the story, not Kazdan, so keep that in mind. But without further ado, let's actually talk about Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. The movie has a clever transition from presenting itself as a Paramount picture to showing us a mountain that looks a lot like the Paramount Mountain. Bravo. 
Anyways, the movie starts in South America, 1936. As I said before in other videos when you think about it, Raiders has an irrelevant opening story-wise, yet it's pivotal to the series because it shows us who Indiana Jones is. I feel the first 10 minutes gives the most substance to the main character in the shortest amount of time. Indiana Jones, again, was designed as an American competitor to James Bond. And I remember George Lucas saying in the Empire of Dreams documentary that that you should go into a movie expecting it to be a total failure and not expecting to make 50 sequels. As such, showing us a bit of Indiana Jones before the main story starts was actually quite clever. It's basically a mini adventure designed to introduce us to the character. In the intro, you can piece together that Indiana Jones is on an expedition with some less than trustworthy characters. One of them is Satipo, played by one Alfred Molina in his first big film role. If that name doesn't click right away, let me give you a reminder. These things have turned you into something you're not. Don't listen to them. It was my dream. Sometimes. To do what's right, we have to be steady and give up the thing we want the most, even our dreams. Yeah, that's right. It's one of the most iconic villains in the comic book genre of movies. It's cool that he had a noteworthy role in another critically acclaimed movie. Anyways, while not explicitly said in the movie, in the novelization, these guys are guides that Indy hired to assist him with navigating the jungle. But little does he know that these guys intend to stab him in the back and take the idol from him. Indy's face is not shown for a few minutes while the opening credits roll. They, however, reveal his face in an awesome way. One of the guides, named Baranka in external materials, Tyrrell opts to ambush him by pulling out a gun on him. Indy hears the click of the gun, however, and uses his iconic weapon to whip the gun off the dude. And that's where he does his iconic turn around to the camera. The serious look Harrison Ford gives is so good. Given another guide saw a statue, got scared and ran off, that leaves us with Satipo. Indy and Satipo enter the temple. Despite Satipo's objections that nobody's come out of there alive, but that doesn't stop Indy from going in. Then, of course, a common trope of these movies is born. Creepy crawlies. We've got a scene where some tarantulas are on Indy's back, and he brushes them off. Easy. But when Satipo turns his back, and oh my god, there's so many of them. If this movie, and the rest of the series succeeds at anything, it's effective shock value. I hear for this one scene, they put a bunch of male tarantulas on Alfred Molina's back, but they wouldn't budge on moving. So they put a female one on him and they all started moving. Anyways, Indy and Satipo narrowly avoid a trap. Indy, who is incredibly experienced, triggers the light from a safe distance, and we see one of his rivals, Forrestal, was killed by the trap. Indy references how he knew this random deceased character. That's interesting, because I never got onto that despite me watching the movie constantly on repeat when I was younger. This is the sort of movie where you can go back after 20 watches and still find something new about it. The story and the universe is very intricately written. Indiana Jones as a character was well thought out, having a lot of history. Anyways, Indy and Satipo use the whip to swing across a chasm. Indy makes it across just fine, but Satipo has to be caught by Indy. Then of course, one of the most iconic scenes in this film, the Golden Idol. We get this great shot of Indy coming out the light and seeing the Golden Idol a couple of meters away, just there for the taking. Satipo agrees with me, as he assumes there's no more traps, but Indy stops him, making sure to be extra careful. He digs out a trap and activates it with some wood. The trap activates and shoots an arrow straight at the wood. Indy tells Satipo to step back as he carefully steps towards the Golden Idol. The tension rises as Indy gets slowly closer and closer to the Golden Idol. The way it's presented, the idol becomes more and more majestic the closer we are to it. John Williams' score also assists the scene as Indy gets closer and closer. Indy gets in arm's reach to the idol and is extra careful. He pulls out a weighted bag of sand, intending to swap the idol with the bag of sand. With the hope that the sand will trick the trap system into believing the idol wasn't taken in the first place. Indy, of course, carefully plans out his swiping, and when he takes the idol, it seems that all is good. 
until the temple starts to shake and goes absolutely mental. Like the temple itself is pissed that Indy took the idol. Indy runs fast enough to literally dodge the traps, which is a good way to show us how fast he's running. Satipo of course uses the rope, but it snaps off when it gets to the other side. Satipo pressures Indy to throw the idol in exchange for the whip, but upon doing so, Satipo is like, Adios, senor. Hello, Peter. So yeah, Satipo stabs him in the back and leaves him. Indy is forced to jump across instead, but nearly falls to his death. However, Indy manages to climb up, roll under the closing door and retrieve his whip. Immediately upon doing so, he stumbles across the now dead Satipo who got caught in the traps the moment after ditching Indy. Certainly less heroic than his sacrifice in Spider-Man 2. Anyways, with Satipo dead, Indy needs to start trying to do better. Indy then sees the iconic rolling boulder and tries to outrun it, nearly tripping in the process, before jumping out of the temple. Damn, how do you make so many iconic moments in the first 10 minutes of a movie? This is incredibly impressive from the part of Lucas and Spielberg, and maybe Kazan too with the one time he was a competent writer. Anyhow, Indy doesn't get to celebrate yet as all the natives have their primal weapons drawn at him. We see Baranka got caught by the natives. One of the natives pushes him down, and he collapses face first, seeing all the poison darts on his back. What a way to show that this guy was unlucky. Then, we get introduced to one of the main villains, who unapologetically and casually walks over his dead body. This is Belloc, the French rival of Indiana Jones. He greets Indy, telling him he's been outmatched. Now, he has to give up the Golden Idol. I wouldn't explicitly call Belloc a hateable villain. In fact, I'd say that as a character, he isn't actually that scummy. At least compared to the other villains. Our first impressions of Belloc, however, is a manipulator who swayed the natives to his side and showed up to steal something that Indy rightfully obtained by avoiding all those traps. Indy has to hand over his gun and the idol. Indy remarks how these natives don't know him like he does. Of course, we've got Belloc's famous response. Yes, too bad. You could warn them. If only you spoke Hovitos. When Belloc raises the idol in front of all the natives who bowed down, Indy seizes the opportunity to escape. Belloc of course signals for the Hovitos to chase after him. So here, we've got our classic escape sequence. We see Indy's escape ride, a plane with his pilot, Jock fishing. Indy comes out, screaming for Jock to start the plane, with the utmost intensity. We see that Jock doesn't start the plane right away, but when we see that Indy's serious, he goes to start the plane. Indy swims to the plane as it takes off, but he isn't able to relax, even when he's in the air. As we see his biggest recurring fear throughout the series, snakes. Yeah. Indy has a phobia of snakes, he hates them. And Jock tries to tell him that it's just his pet snake, Reggie. So to sum this intro up, it's excellent. Again, it does a great job of introducing Indiana Jones. It shows us who he is and all of his gimmicks. His bullwhip, his appearance, his fear of snakes, all in the course of the first 10 minutes. A recognizable, iconic character almost instantly. That's a pretty hard thing to do. With that being said though, we should get on with the main plot, which shows us what Indy does when he isn't dodging traps or running away from hostile natives who are blowing darts at him. He's a college professor, in which he teaches archaeology. It's a huge contrast when it comes to what he did in the first 10 minutes. Teaching is different from exploring. Anyhow, Marcus Brody, a pivotal character in the series, although his role in this movie is rather small, informs him about some American agents who want to see him. Basically, it's about those damn Nazis that have popped up around three years ago history-wise. Led by a crazy dude named Adolf Hitler. Extremely racist, silly mustache, you know him. Basically, Nazi excavators are looking for the Ark of the Covenant, otherwise the Lost Ark. The agents inform Indy that the Nazis are digging for it outside of Cairo, Egypt. This is perhaps the least memorable part of the movie, arguably. So it's good that it didn't start this way, but establishing the mythology that is going to come full circle is great. I especially like the visual representation of paintings that demonstrate the Ark of the Covenant. It gives what is essentially the MacGuffin a majestic vibe before we've even seen it. All the Indy artifacts have that vibe. Will Dial of Destiny have that? Who knows? 
What even is a Dial of Destiny anyways? Is that just a title which just like the sequel trilogy doesn't mean squat? Probably. Now, a common criticism you could levy at every indie movie are historical inaccuracies. Obviously, I doubt the Nazis found the Lost Ark and shenanigans happened with an American archaeologist, but I'm talking about general stuff. In this movie, anyone who knows about World War II will be confused why American agents are going up to Indy to investigate the Lost Ark. Why the hell don't the British or the French contact him? Why's it gotta be American agents? So we get a final scene with Brody before Indy takes off to go meet his mentor Abner Ravenwood, who lives in Nepal, as he's got a neck piece that ties to the Ark of the Covenant. Marcus shows some concern around the Ark of the Covenant, and Indy tells him that he doesn't believe in magic. Then of course, Indy goes on his original adventure for the Lost Ark. He boards a plane and heads for Nepal, presumably the Himalayan mountains, which is super damn cold. A small detail when Indy boards the plane is that we get a brief shot of this random guy looking down from reading a magazine, and his stare tells us that he means business. Then, another iconic staple of this movie happens when we get a geographic indicator of the plane's flight from California to Hawaii to Japan, I think, to Nepal. This would be replicated to every other indie movie from my recollection. When we get to Nepal, we are introduced to Marion Ravenwood, who is Abner's daughter. We get an interesting scene of a drinking competition between her and some dude. Gee, this movie has the classic George Lucas trope of foreshadowing. This movie has the classic George Lucas trope of foreshadowing, as stuff we're introduced to early is referenced later. Marion is shown to be extremely resilient when it comes to alcohol. She can drink more than enough and keep going. She can easily beat the unnamed opponent who passes out and wins the drinking game. It's shown to be around night, so everyone is in a wrapping up stage before going home. I love this shot that indicates Indy's shadow. It's here where Indy greets Marion, only to be punched in the face by her. Marion says that she's grown to hate him in the last 10 years since they met. Why? Well, in the movie itself, it's extremely subtle. I've watched this movie a million times, and I was never able to figure it out until someone online described what George Lucas conceptualized from Marion and Indy's rocky relationship. This is where I talk about something that I think everyone dislikes about this movie. And since this movie is considered one of the very best, that's saying something. Marion only hints in the dialogue that Indy had a romantic relationship with her when she was underage. By that, I mean that the movie very loosely hints. It's never made explicitly clear what happened between the both of them. George Lucas has stated via the script, he made this very hidden. It's not spelled out to you, so it's easy to miss. Indy is 37 or 38 when this movie happens, and Marion is 25. So if you piece together the whole story, it's clear that Indy in his 20s had an illegal relationship with Marion. Man, do I feel so dirty for talking about this. When I realized what was going on, it puts an iconic character like Indiana Jones into a whole new light. He did something highly illegal. To be honest, this might be the actual worst writing decision George Lucas made. Realizing that Indy may actually be a child molester would ruin the character for anyone. On the upside, again, it's really subtly told, so most people never piece it together. So yeah, this is extremely iffy writing. Still though, I don't think George Lucas is a creep, like some people have tried to push. It's one small line of dialogue, and it's not something the movie hammers home in the slightest. Plus, George Lucas as far as I can tell admitted to this weird writing decision. But let me tell you, it's nowhere near as bad as this guy when he writes certain characters. Anyways, Indy tries to bargain with Marion for a piece of her father's collection. And it's here where Indy learns that Abner has passed away. Ouch. Still though, Indy tries to give Marion money for the piece that he needs, but she tells him to come back tomorrow. And so Indy leaves. Cue the bad guys. Moments after Indy leaves, Marion has a look at the piece she held onto. We see a guy named Major Arnold Tote walk in. He wants the exact same thing Indy came in for. 
Now, in terms of this movie, I couldn't really pinpoint who the main villain is exactly. I say this because the three guys you could point to as the main villains have a varying amount of presence. Belloc, for example, isn't the one in charge exactly. He's probably the main antagonist for Indy as a character, but the way the movie is presented, he doesn't come across as the main villain. It's sort of shared amongst three guys, and Major Tote is one of them. Tote is probably the most imposing villain for this one scene. Played by the late Ronald Lacey, the dude puts on this really creepy German accent. He has the vibe of the creepy kid at school, now an adult. It's an indicator that this guy is sinister. It's shown that he doesn't even opt to negotiate. As stated, he showed up with a group of thugs, gets them to pin Marion, and pulls a hot iron by the fireplace in order to get Marion to tell them where Abner's piece is. Normally, someone who looks sort of like Rick Moranis wouldn't be intimidating, but it's that touch that turns him into an imposing and ruthless villain. The villains in the Indiana Jones series are meant to be hateable. And right here, I'd say Arnold Tote is a great villain, easily one of the best in the series. This is Indy's first on-screen fight with goons in this movie. And I really admire the action here. Indy takes out each bad guy in a different way. For example, one guy gets caught on fire and Indy shoots him right in the head. He takes out another guy when he's pinning Indy down by getting Marion to give him a whiskey bottle, which he uses to break himself free right before the fire hits his face. Tote during all this notices the medallion Marion dropped and tries to pick it up, but instead burns his hand from the heat and runs outside plunging it in the snow to cool it off. After Marion shoots the last bad guy, she recovers the medallion and she and Indy escape her place as it burns to the ground. This here is where Indy and Marion team up and now they head to Cairo, where a lot of the movie happens. It's here where we meet one of Indy's friends, whom he has a lot of in the franchise, and the one that seems to appear to skip the movie that comes next. He was in this movie, was absent in Temple of Doom, appeared in Last Crusade, skipped out in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and now he's going to be in the dreaded Dial of Destiny, which I think will pretty much be his last on-screen appearance. It's like Sulla is allergic to even numbers or something. It's a weird observation I had. We know that they're only bringing Sulla back, because what else aren't they bringing back for cheap nostalgia? You want to see Indy fight Nazis again just like the good old days? Before Crystal Skull supposedly ruined the series? Because no, I don't want to see that. We've already had that in two movies made by better filmmakers. Dial of Destiny is going to be like The Force Awakens and pretend to solve everything, when in actuality, they'll just be repeating the mistakes of the sequel trilogy. Thankfully, Kathleen Kennedy will be out of the picture after Dial of Destiny, reportedly. They might find someone worse, but that pest has been in charge for too long. Enough with the tangent, though. Sulla is one of the most well-known supporting characters in the Indiana Jones franchise. He also appears in some expanded Indiana Jones adventures, too. With that being said, Sulla is a chad. He is a loyal friend to Indy and does a lot to assist him however he can at every turn. Our first extended interaction with Sulla and Indy is Sulla sitting down for a real discussion with them. After telling him he knows a guy who can help locate the lost Ark, he makes his concern about the Ark of the Covenant clear. It's also here where Sulla mentions that Belloc from the opening of the movie is assisting the Nazis. Anyways, we are shown Indy and Marion out of town. I presume they're going on a walk given how they act. But since a movie with filler is a grand mistake, this ties into the main story. As Marion is carrying around a monkey shown in an earlier scene, the monkey is hinted at being aggressive, and then it runs off, and we see that the monkey actually has an allegiance to the bad guys. The monkey runs over to some shady looking dude with an eye patch. In this movie, appearances and personas sell everything. Of course, this leads to an action sequence with Indy and Marion being attacked by some thugs in town. Indy gets Marion to run while he takes out the bad guys. But while fleeing, Marion gets carried away by a cart, in which she's now on her own. There's the classic frying pan smack out where Marion knocks out a guy with said item and drags his body inside and then she proceeds to hide in a basket just before the bad guys show up. But since the monkey is aligned to the bad guys, the damn thing alerts the bad guys to Marion's location. There's the iconic scene where a swordsman confronts Indy, and he's like, let's fight, and is super ready for a classic sword fight. 
but Inu just pulls his gun and shoots him. And it's gone. What a way to surprise me. This actually wasn't supposed to be in the film, but Harrison Ford got a saw back while shooting, and so he just suggested just shooting the guy. That's one way to trim the runtime, but it's also an iconic and funny joke. Indy takes out a dude with a gun to save himself so much time. Indy then spends the next minute looking for Marion, as they got separated. He notices her being carried on a basket, and follows her and the bad guys to a truck. He shoots the drivers, which trips the truck over, and since the truck was loaded with explosive, the truck blows up as if Michael Bay was involved, and for the time being, Indy believes he just killed Marion. This death fake out lasted for around 12 to 13 minutes. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if you guys remember the Rise of Skywalker, they fake killed Chewie in the dumbest way. Like apparently Chewie died in a separate transport that the good guys would have definitely seen, and then when the sad moment happens, in the very next scene he's shown to be alive, and you're like, WHAT THE HELL?! Besides, the death fake out in Raiders is done well, because when Marion is revealed to be alive, it's not all hunky dory, but we'll get to that when we get to that. When Indy believes Marion is dead, in the next scene, he goes to drink himself out, and the sorrow tone is done effectively. Accompanying him, of course, is that damn monkey to keep him company. It's here where Indy comes face to face with his arch rival, Belloc once again. Belloc, like earlier, is one smug motherfucker. We see that while the two are talking, guns are being passed around in the background. Belloc has that classic speech where he tells Indy that they are not so much different. It will only take a nudge to make them the same. Indy hardly responds to this. One of my favorite lines from Belloc in this movie is him talking about a watch he got for $10, which is next to worthless, but if he buries it in the sand for a thousand years, it becomes priceless, which brings him to the Lost Ark. He tells Indy that the Ark is a transmitter to God, and Indy responds back with a spat. If it's God they want to see, they'll go see him together right here, right now until everyone in the bar pulls a gun on him. You think he's dead, but Sulla's kids show up to surround him, and so Belloc lets him off, telling him it'll take more than children to save him next time. Sulla comes to pick him up to the guy he knows, but still, this isn't the end of the bad guys trying to kill Indy, as the eye patch guy follows them. And it's here where it's established that the Nazis are digging in the wrong place, given they only have a rough measurement for the location of the Ark. When Indy and Sulla discover through Sulla friend what the medallion is saying, that being a warning not to disturb the Ark, and the other side saying that there needs to be a staff attached to the medallion of the correct size for the medallion to work properly. In the meanwhile, the eye patch guy poisons the food, which before Indy eats, is caught by Seller as they see the monkey got a taste too, and it killed him. When watching the scene, the poison food was on my mind, and you're just hoping that Indy doesn't eat it. This, of course, is where the really exciting stuff happens. We cut to the Nazi dig site in Cairo. Belloc and Colonel Dietrich, another one of the villains who is the guy in charge of the excavation. This is where we finally meet the three villains as a whole. Dietrich is probably the least prominent of the three main villains. This is why I said this movie doesn't really have a prominent key, absolute main villain. To describe Dietrich, He's a douche. He and Belloc argue a lot, and that's his character. We've pretty much reached the halfway point of the movie, and I have to say it holds up extremely well. It's a great adventure story, with a clear goal, memorable characters, whether they be likable or hateable. Anyways, Indy and Sulla go to the map room which is supposed to tell you the location of the Lost Star. Indy goes down with his whip, and it's here where we get one of the movie's most iconic scenes. Indy is supposed to put the staff in a certain place. Sulla is unfortunately taken away, but finds his way back up to help hoist Indy up later. John Williams' score peaks as Indy is searching for the correct spot to place the staff, just as 9am rolls around. We see visually Indy work this all out, and when he places the staff in the right place, the light directs him towards the correct location. And in its full glory, Indy has essentially discovered the location of the titular Lost Ark. A great moment in this film, and definitely one of the highlights. Indy breaks the staff, and climbs up. Sulla serves as a distraction while Indy searches around, and it's here where Indy realizes Marion is still alive, though gagged and tied up. 
Indy realizes that he can't free her right now because that will draw the attention of the Nazis. Indy pins out the location of Lost Ark and plans to dig it up. We see meanwhile that Belloc is ordered by Dietrich to question Marion and we also get reintroduced to Toad who shows his hand that kind of healed from the burn but now he's got the thing burnt onto his flesh. Indy, Sulla and friends meanwhile dig up the location of the Ark all the way into night time, where all the Nazis and their workers stop to sleep for the night. I like these guys thinking, get the Ark before the Nazis do, and what a better time to get the Ark out of there than to do it when they're all sleeping. We of course, cut to Marion untied by Belloc. Belloc apologizes for how the Nazis thus far have treated her, and gives her some food and water. This here is where we see Belloc is a charmer, almost like Indiana Jones himself. A random fact about Belloc, he engaged in the act of plagiarism. Yeah, it says on the Indiana Jones wiki quote, Belloc eventually came across a paper on stratigraphy by Jones and plagiarized the work. As a result, he was awarded the Archaeological Society Prize, with Jones unable to prove the theft. Damn, our boy Belloc committed plagiarism. Not only did he steal the idol from Indy, but also his thoughts and opinions and passed it off as his own. I thought I might as well mention that, because that's what my channel is about. Stealing the hard work from others and passing it off as my own. Anyways, Marion plays that drinking game with Belloc and tries to use that as an opportunity to escape. But of course, Toad is there to ruin the day. Right afterwards, Indy and Sulla carry the Ark of the Covenant, and I especially like the lighting here. It gives the feeling of a gold majestic item. While carrying the Ark back up, Belloc and the Nazis intercept what Indy is up to. As always, Belloc taunts Indy at taking something he briefly possessed, this time, the Ark of the Covenant. As a villain, Belloc is always one step ahead of Indy. It's that common villain trope of always beating the hero to something, and it's done well here. Dietrich, however, comes in, telling Indy that they're gonna bury him in there, but he will also have some company down there, before getting Toad to throw Marion in, much to the surprise and dismay of Belloc. Yeah, maybe the one redeemable thing about Belloc. He's not happy about Marion getting thrown down. And now it's up to Indy and Marion to escape. Despite having a great phobia of snakes, he is able to improvise. He uses his whip to climb up one of the statues and tip it over onto the wall, which it breaks open. With that, they can escape. We see that the Ark is about to be loaded onto a plane. The next comes one of the most iconic set pieces. And yeah, I know that this whole movie is iconic, but this is one of the most iconic of the scenes. Take a shot for every time I say iconic. This is the classic fist fight scene with a bigger, tougher guy. In the original Indiana Jones trilogy, he was played by the late Pat Roach playing different characters. In this movie, he plays two characters. He first played one of Toad's goons from Nepal, and in this scene, he plays the more memorable muscular mechanic. He has quite the entrance too. He comes out of a hut, witnesses Indy fist fighting a mechanic, and smiles, indicating he wants to join the party. Marion joins in too, knocking out the pylon, who plants his head on some of the controls that cause the plane to start moving. Marion herself though, gets trapped in the cockpit. Also, also, some gasoline spills, and it's extremely reactive as a set piece, with one event affecting another, and this makes the whole sequence more believable. Even if the fist fight in the middle of all of this is really hammy with the sound effects. Eventually though, the muscular mechanic eventually finds out what a propeller does to the human body, and gets cut into bits. While not shown, his blood splatters on the ship, and you can just piece together how graphic it would have been. Anyways, Indy frees Marion from the cockpit, and they bolt out of there just in time. Despite slowing the Nazis down, they're not gonna stop there, and thus we get the next set piece. Indy and Marion meet up with Sulla, who informs them on their enemy's backup plan. They're going to load a truck convoy to get the Ark out of Egypt, so Indy's gotta stop them and recover the lost Ark. So he gets on a horse and chases after the convoy. Once again, John Williams' score is brilliant. During this action sequence, Indy hijacks the truck with the Ark on it, and evades the Nazis either trying to shoot him, or trying to rip control away from him. In the ladder, there were Nazis in the back of the truck he was driving, who tried to make their way to the driver's seat. 
Indy gets the truck to brush up against some leaves to knock over the bad guys. One of them actually does manage to land a lucky hit on Indy, although it isn't fatal. In terms of being an action hero, Indy always seems to be on the more vulnerable side, like John McClane, although not as realistic. It may take Indy some time to take out the bad guys, but he comes out of every encounter relatively fine at least. The last Nearsy actually manages to take control away from Indy, at least briefly, and knock him off the truck, but Indy demonstrates his whip again. Due to wearing leather, he is able to not scrape his flesh all over the ground when recovering his footing. This part of the movie is clearly meant to raise tension in the audience at a movie theater. I imagine people watching this when this first came out were gasping for Indy's safety. Indy manages to get back on the truck and push the guy out, in which we see the guy getting flattened by the truck although it's shot in an off-screen angle. Indy eventually manages to lose the bad guys, and for now, the Ark is safe in American hands. We cut to later that night, where Sola tells Indy about how he's got a smuggler friend named Captain Katanga, who will help Indy and Marion smuggle the Ark out of Egypt. Indy says a heartfelt goodbye to Sola, and it's done really well, Given this is the first indie movie, and they didn't know whether or not they'd have a franchise on their hands, this is potentially the last time we see this character. Marion also kisses Sala as her form of thanks. The film goes into its climax phase effectively. The next scene has Marion and Indy rekindle their relationship on Captain Katanga's smuggling vessel. I don't have a lot to say about this scene. It's just a nice little scene to show their relationship recover. Again, very iffy how it started, but they fully made up by this point. But uh-oh, the Nazi show up to take the Ark away, and Indy is forced to hide, while Marion is captured again. The Nazis decide to spare Captain Katanga and his crew, and Indy makes his way over to the Nazi U-boat, much to the applause of the smuggling crew. It's a small moment, but it shows us how far Indy is willing to go for Marion. The U-boat travels to an island somewhere in the Aegean Sea. Belloc intends to demonstrate the power of the Ark on this island, before bringing it to Dafu. On the island, Indy disguises himself as one of the Nazis. In a scene that was filmed in the exact same location as the Jawas capture R2 scene from A New Hope, Indy appears from up a hill and threatens to blow the Ark up. In Belloc's last on-screen interaction with Indy, he knows that Indy doesn't have it in him to destroy a historical artifact, and Indy knows it too. He abandons the idea of blowing up the Lost Ark, and so he too is captured. This part I really like. It demonstrates how Belloc knows Indy too much to be fooled by him. It's like at the start of the movie where Belloc took the golden idol from Indy. He knew he'd be there to deliver the idol straight to him unwillingly. Nevertheless, Indy and Marion end up being tied up on a post. While the bad guys do their ritual, the Nazis have got stock cameras and the whole shebang to demonstrate the power of the Ark. At first, when it's opened, it's nothing but sand inside. But immediately after, guess what happens next? The power of the Ark deactivates all the machinery around, and the spirits of the Lost Ark start to take shape. Indy throughout all this has a realization. He cannot look at the Lost Ark. He tells Marion to keep her eyes shut, as he does the same. You might be wondering why, and the film never really explains it. It's just that Indy knows that the Ark in this moment is not meant to be looked at. Fortunately, Belloc and friends didn't realize this. They stare at the Ark spirits in all its glory, and it turns into their downfall. The spirits of the Lost Ark turn evil, resulting in the three main bad guys screaming their asses off in torment. On top of all the extras being evaporated by a supernatural beam, and we get these really cool special effects. First Dietrich's head shrinks, Toad's head melts off, and Belloc's head explodes. The most impressive of which is undoubtedly the melting head. I watched a featurette about it on the Raiders of the Lost Stark DVD, and Spielberg talks about how he too was impressed. It might be one of the best effects in the whole series. If you haven't seen the movie a million times like I have, it's pure shock value. Something different, yet graphic for each villain. Apparently they even had to cover up Belloc's exploding head with fire, so they could get the appropriate rating they wanted. With the demise of all the bad guys, the Ark closes after the ghosts have had some time going around the island. We even see that the bodies are all sucked up. 
presumably to God. When all of this ends, Indian and Marion open their eyes, discovering that their rope is burnt off, and they're free to go home. We cut to Washington DC, in which India is told by the American agents that the Ark is to be moved to an undisclosed location to be researched by quote, top men. While unsatisfactory for Indy, he was rewarded, and walks away with Marion. The last shot we see of the Lost Stark ever, is it being moved to a warehouse with a ton of other crates, then cue the credits. Damn. Rewatching the movie for the millionth time and it's still entertaining. Now I remember why I watched all four of these movies on repeat all the time. To sum it up, it's a golden main character, memorable set pieces, an interesting story with interesting mythology, great supporting characters, effective hateable villains, and an overall idol in cinema. I gotta hand it to Lucas and Spielberg for making this movie, and giving us the Indiana Jones franchise. Despite many areas of the film's production being rocky, they got their shit together and made a movie that started an extremely popular trilogy, an underappreciated fourth entry, and is now going to be corporatized with Disney having their shot at making a fifth movie. I've made it clear that I have no hope for the Dial of Destiny, but it will no doubt have its supporters, with people claiming that it saved the indie franchise, when in actuality it did no such thing. Time travel will just be a lame excuse to bring back all of the iconic shit with the least amount of effort, and due to what the leak said, I'm completely writing it off in terms of it being any good. I will of course review it, but beyond that, the days of indie being an unruined franchise is numbered. Maybe the Bethesda Indiana Jones game will be good, but aside from that, I'm dreading Disney getting their dirty hands on Indy. It's a miracle that they left it alone for as long as they did, but now the dark times are upon us. But for this movie, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark gets a solid 9.7 out of 10, one of the highest honours I can bestow a film. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories but mystery boxes? In the agonizing build-up to Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, we're going to take a look back at the second Indiana Jones movie, The Temple of Doom. Right off the bat, this is the coolest title for an Indiana Jones movie. Obviously, Dial of Destiny is the worst title by far, but if we pretend that movie doesn't exist, it would be hard for me to decide which title is the worst although Temple of Doom is the best. Unlike the first movie in the indie saga, Temple of Doom seems to be hated by a lot of people. Temple of Doom, as conceptualized by George Lucas, was intended to be a film detached from the first movie, which I like. I've said many times that you're never gonna go anywhere with your IP if you don't innovate. The second film is still recognizable as an Indiana Jones movie, as it has the same protagonist, obviously. A MacGuffin that has religious cultural significance, and other stuff that was in the first film. Temple of Doom was a very risky film to make. Some might have seen it as too different, but George Lucas likes different. As he said about Star Wars, he made sure to make every film different from each other. From what I understand, George Lucas had a fascination with Indian culture, something which I honestly don't give two shits about. Sorry people from India and surrounding regions, but it was just never to my taste. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom made it interesting in the movie's context, but from what I hear, how the movie depicts certain things wasn't received well by everyone. The two locations visited in this movie, China and India, have made the movie widely unpopular by Chinese and Indian people. For the second movie, it was a prequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark in the timeline, although it's not a direct prequel, because it does not continue the story from Raiders of the Lost Ark. The reason for this is because Raiders' story was done and finished. The Indiana Jones franchise at this point was designed to tell standalone stories with the same protagonist. That's absolutely fine. The Indiana Jones formula was designed like that. And while indie stories may have references to other adventures, each adventure has its own end goal. Dial of Destiny though seems like it'll be too derivative off of previous films. They'll probably undo Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which will be a massive mistake. And Dial back to Raiders and Last Crusade. I imagine there will be minimal references to Temple of Doom at that rate too. Something I have to point out is that making Dial of Destiny politically correct in of itself is a mistake. Because when has Indiana Jones ever been politically correct? 
Every indie movie is potentially going to offend someone eventually. So by going woke, you're inevitably going to fail. Because the series identity is anything but woke. Now, we're going to have an indie film that misses the point. Anyways, you've heard me ramble enough. Let's talk about Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. The movie starts in 1935 China. 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 You go over to China. At Club Obi-Wan. <laughs> He said it! He said it! We start with a musical sequence of the song Anything Goes. I like the transition from Paramount to here quite well. It's a sequence to set the tone for our starting location. A club in the city of Shanghai. The largest Chinese city. Whether that was the case in 1935 too, I have no idea. But regardless, this is where our movie starts. Just like the first indie movie, we've got a mini adventure to go into before we experience the main event. From what I understand, this prologue is heavily expanded upon in the LucasArts video game Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb, but I've only played the starting levels of that game, and it's a discussion for another time. We start with a deal between Indian Chinese crime boss Lao Zhi, who hired him to recover the remains of Nurhachi. The setup to this movie was really well thought out. You can piece together an implied backstory in the first minute of dialogue alone. I commonly thought when I was a kid that the Star Wars prequels deserved their own prequel trilogy. Well now that I think about it, the same is true here. And well, there is the Emperor's Tomb. Anyways, with that being said, during the deal, Loud tricks Indy into drinking poison, and pulls out a convenient antidote to taunt him. One may question why he pulled out an antidote, but in the context of the film, it's because he wanted to sway Indy into doing what he wanted. Things, however, aren't doom and gloom yet. Indy reveals his own ally, Wu Han, who is quickly taken down without much notice from everyone else. We didn't have much time to know this character, but I still felt his death. He alludes to various adventures he had with Indy prior to this point. An enraged Indy proceeds to stab one of Lao's sons with a shish kebab. Anyways, the antidote is sort of used as a MacGuffin for Indy to desperately retrieve to cure himself of the poison. Chaos ensues with the gunshot and Indy's efforts to search for the antidote. I should also mention the character Willie Scott, who is Indy's girl for this specific movie. She's introduced as a dancer and singer at Lao Shi's nightclub, who soon gets caught with Indy's antics. Designed as the complete contrast to Marion Ravenwood, Willie Scott has been described as annoying. Do I agree? Kinda, but I don't think it detracts from the film. Her personality of constantly screaming and complaining is played for laughs, and it's derivative of the sort of humor Indiana Jones is known for. Perhaps I'll note certain instances of this when we come across it. Anyways, there's this creative part where Indy grabs a display sword and cuts open a large gong, and uses it to flee the nightclub with Willy. Then comes the introduction of one of my favorite characters in the series, a Chinese boy ironically named Short Round, who serves as Indy's trusty sidekick. This kid is fucking gold in every scene he's in. One of the stereotype jokes they pull is the one where Short Round is the getaway driver, because haha, ha, they let kids drive cars in China. That's what I always interpreted the joke as anyways, but on the real, Short Round is a pretty good driver. There's this exchange where Indy searches Willie's area for the antidote, and Short Round says, and I quote, Hey, Dr. Joe, no time for love! We got company! And we've got this chase sequence in which Indy shoots the gangsters, and when Indy gives Willie his gun, she drops it out of the car right away, complaining only that her fingernail was cracked. It's no secret that Willie is an incompetent bitch who clearly does not want to be on this adventure. Indy secures a flight out of China and taunts Lao Zhi just as he shows up. Except it's shown visually that the plane belongs to Lao Zhi. And it's set up perfectly where you've got that uh-oh reaction. Anyways, Indy dresses into his normal attire and goes to sleep on the plane. The plane travels from Shanghai to the Himalayas, in which the pilots who work for Lao check to see that Indy and friends are asleep and jump off the plane with a parachute in the hopes that Indy will stay asleep and the plane will crash without them. They jettison out the fuel and jump out, 
Willie is the first to wake up and realizes no one flying the plane. And upon short round warning Indy that there's no more parachutes, Indy off the top of his head instead jumps out of the plane with an inflatable raft. John Williams' score pumps the fuck on as they narrowly escape death. Now in comes Willie's complaining. As per what I said, she complains about being in the situation. But it's kinda understandable, since they just jumped out of a plane and narrowly avoided death. But the dialogue spoken is actually pretty good. She's essentially listing off everything in the moment she hates, which includes Indy. Short Round has a notable presence in all following scenes too. After floating around in the river next to the Himalayas, not exactly sure what the geography is supposed to be, they end up in, what do you know, India. George's interest in Indian culture comes full circle here. We get this shot of a darker skinned man walking across the side of the river, and the local man brings Indy to his village. Just like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I gotta praise the set design. I truly feel immersed in the setting as it feels like they're truly in India, or at least, how a westerner probably visualizes India. The village treats them with the utmost kindness and respect, as the visibly malnourished people give Indian friends food, and this is where the larger quest comes in. The village elder, or whoever, asks for Indy to retrieve an item known as the Sankara Stone that was stolen by evil forces at Pankot Palace. The Thuggy Cult. The dialogue sets up some intriguing mystery, as well as an ominous line where the Elder tells Indian friends that it was the Hindu god Shiva that brought them here, so that they could help get the stones back. And the scene is played dead serious, so it makes you wonder since the last movie had supernatural shit in it, that it also applies to Hinduism in the Indiana Jones universe. The movie was based on George's interest in Indian culture after all, They've shown the missing spot where the stone was stolen, and now it's the classic quest to retrieve the stone. During the decision, a child who was revealed to be enslaved by the thug cult escaped and made it back to the village, exhausted. This kid managed to get away, although many of the children remain enslaved. There's a discussion between Short Round and Indy, and this is Indy's incentive to check out Pankot Palace. The village gives them everything they need, especially elephants for transport. And when Willie finds out they're going to Pankot Palace, she unsurprisingly complains about it. So during the trip, Willie gets knocked off by an elephant, and Indy decides it's here where they'll camp tonight. It's here where the chemistry between Indy and Short Round occurs. While Willie's being such a bitch, Indy and Short Round are playing a card game, and accuse each other of cheating. This kid's actor is so damn good, and feels like a kid at the same time. Short Round is depicted as a resourceful and brave kid. When Willie asks, Indy explains that he met Short Round when he was a pocket trying to rob him after the Japanese bombing of Shanghai in 1932 killed his parents. Short Round throughout this movie proves to be a useful asset to Indy, despite being so young. He earned the title of sidekick, and as the movie plays, Short Round sees Indy as his father figure. This is what makes Short Round one of my favourites in the series. I looked into the production of the film from the perspective of Short Round's actor, and he had fun on making the film, and it shows. He's also grateful for Spielberg getting him cast in The Goonies too, and it all comes across as humble. Anyways, after more hiking, they make it all the way to Pankot Palace. Approaching the palace, Indy and friends are greeted by Pankot Prime Minister Chatalol. They're all invited inside as guests, with the Prime Minister in particular recognizing Indy as the famous archaeologist that he is. It's here where we get a taste of a Western version of Indian culture. If you've seen the movie, you'll know eventually we'll have to talk about the elephant in the room, and how fitting since elephants were in this movie too. So Indian friends get settled in the palace. On first glance, Pankot Palace seems pretty normal, and the movie gives the impression that it is. And it's also here where we meet a British captain. No evil cult in sight here. Although Indy is adamant about questioning the Prime Minister about what the villagers said about the palace. The Prime Minister dismisses the villagers as just making shit up. Although the Prime Minister does give one of his underlings a look. That basically tells us, yeah, this guy knows too much. We also meet the Maharaja, who to the dismay of Willy, is actually just a kid. In the meanwhile, we get some effective gross out. Although derivative off of Indian stereotypes. Willie and Short Round share a scene where they are prepared to eat some food at a banquet, but then the food comes out, and it's the most disgusting, unappetizing things you can think of. 
For example, a dead snake, which is cut open and some baby snakes come out, which one of the hungry patrons proceeds to eat without concern. It's a, like a classic Indian dish. I've been to India. I haven't seen food like that. It's Northern Indian. Northern Indian. I believe, yeah. Yeah, Northern India. Now, Spielberg has stated that the joke was that they were essentially trolling Willie in short rounds by providing food they expected to see in India due to stereotypes and gross them out on purpose or something like that. I'm paraphrasing. Point is, this is all meant to be a joke and not a deathly serious depiction of India. So yeah, we get snakes inside of a bigger snake, beetles or some kind of bug. And when Willie asks for soup, it's got eyeballs in it. And to top it all off, We've got chilled monkey brains. You cannot make this shit up. Yeah, that's enough for Willie to faint from the unappealing food served. The scene in context is effective as gross out. But at the same time, I hear the complaints that it's a negative portrayal of the kind of food Indians eat. Or rather, what they don't eat. Although the filmmakers have clarified it was meant to be a joke. Indiana Jones, as it stands, is far from politically correct. Anyways, later that evening, Indy has his moment with Willie, where they sweet talk each other with flirtatious dialogue. I guess by this point, Willie is starting to like Indy, especially when he provides her with normal food after the disaster at the banquet. I don't have much to say here. Immediately after though, an assassin arises in Indy's room, who tries to strangle him to death. But knowing the last movie in this one, who isn't trying to kill Indy? Of course, after a good struggle, which is completely organic feeling, Indy with the help of Short Round, counter strangle the thug who gets caught on a fan and ooh, he's dead. Indy trying to figure out where the assassin came from, in which he finds a secret door when looking around Willie's room. I like to mention that it's over 50 minutes, and we're now at the Temple of Doom part, title wise. Still though, the build-up has been sufficient and well-crafted. The adventure has been so fast and entertaining that recalling how the movie started is amazing. They were in China for something unrelated, and now they're in a palace in India. Man has a lot happened already, and we're almost at the halfway point already. Still though, the story isn't convoluted at all. Anyways, Indy and Short Round go into the depths of the Temple of Doom. Willie is reluctant to follow after them, but after some hesitation, she opts to follow after them. By this point, Indy and Short Round have stumbled into a spike trap, and Willie has to save both of them, albeit with Indy's instructions. The problem to Willie is that she's supposed to pull a lever surrounded by more creepy crawlies, and watching it, yep, that's nasty. So after narrowly avoiding another damn trap, Indy and friends proceed to the area of one of the most memorable scenes in the whole movie. The proper introduction of the Kali worshipping thuggy cult. And to the film's main villain. They really built quite the set here. And the scene visually uses the colour red and yellow to signify that some intense shit is going down. Like for real. This is bound to be exactly what people think of when they think of a cult doing cult stuff. When asked by Willy, Indy explains that nobody's seen something like this for a hundred years. Yeah, as if they couldn't build up hype enough. Now I mentioned the main villain being seen around here, and that's correct. Around an hour and one minute into the film, we see the leader of the cult, Mola Ram played by the late Amrish Puri. And damn does this guy mean business. I also like the symbolism of him wearing a cow skull for a hat, which is pretty much desecrating how India values cows. Immediately after, the thuggy cult pulls out a helpless man and strap him into a cage. And Molaram moves in a slow and sinister way, says something in Hindi I presume, and then pulls his hand towards the victim's chest. And in case you haven't seen the movie, he straight up digs into his chest and rips out his heart for all to see. In the most gruesome detail ever, Indy notes how the victim is still alive somehow. Then, if you thought they couldn't top that, we're now going to get into the human sacrifice. The cage is lowered, with excited chants by the cultists, as the helpless man is lowered into a pit of lava and fire. And yeah, he's burnt alive, with Molaram sadistically laughing, holding a burning heart as it melts away. The presentation is gold as the intense music and cuts make this scene jaw-dropping. It is all played for shock value, but it isn't cheap in the slightest. It's all genuine shock created from such a disturbing and memorable scene. The ritual ends with the helpless man sacrificing 
sacrifice to Kali. Indy could do nothing but watch. He couldn't save this man. It's also here where Indy witnesses the stolen Sankara stones, as they're placed in front of a giant skull. After the ritual is over, everyone leaves, and Indy decides to take a big risk, intending to take all three of the stones, because let's face it, the thuggy cultists definitely do not deserve it. He goes further into the Temple of Doom to investigate, but Willy and Short Round are captured by the cultists. Indy discovers the cult's mine that demonstrates another horrible crime child slavery. As the mine is worked by nothing but children in harsh conditions, the head slaver of the mines, played by Pat Roach, who was also the German mechanic in Raiders, returns for the sequel, or prequel, whatever. As a brutal overseer with a whip who constantly whips the slaves if they don't work hard enough, or slip up. Since he's playing a dude from India, he's in brown face, which might be racist, but then I realized I wanted Pat Roach to return for another fight with Indy, and it wouldn't make much sense to make him white. Besides, the brown face isn't used to make a racist statement about Indians. Well, anyways, it's here where Indy is pretty disgusted, and throws a rock at the Overseer. I have to question why he alerted the cult to his presence, but I guess he was going to get caught eventually anyways. Still though, it is a case of poor writing. Anyways, once Indy is captured, he's chained up, and one of the kids in the cell with him talks about how he prayed to die, but Shiva won't let him, and now he'll be subject to the black sleep of Kali. As described, it's basically some black magic that'll turn you into an evil cult worshipper. We cut to a scene sometime later with Indy and Mola Ram's first interaction. Mola Ram drops some backstory for the stones, saying that there were five in the beginning, but due to the span of time, they were separated. That's why they're practicing child slavery, to force the poor kids to dig for the stones. Then of course, they bring out the substance, and force Indy to drink it. With much struggle of course, and Short Round trying the best he can to get him to reject the liquid, but it is eventually forced down his throat as the Maharaja, also with the cult, brings out a voodoo doll to torture Indy. Short Round is forced away to work in the mines like the other kids, and Indy is forced to drink the liquid. Molaram also has an evil monologue where he intends to impose their twisted religion as the only in the world. So in case you think this cult's only going to exist in India, think again. They're going to force everyone else to bow down to them. High stakes supreme now. We get a scene of Indy succumbing to the black sleep of Kali, and after so much struggling, he wakes up reborn, with a twisted and sinister smile. I can only imagine the audience reaction being like, oh no, he's one of them now. The lighting too really sells the scene. This is pretty much the low point of the movie, where everything that could go wrong has. And in the very next scene, we get Willie Scott being prepped for sacrifice to Kali. Indy, now possessed by the dark magic, speaks for the cult, and you can tell that he's a completely different person in this scene. He is visibly possessed by the magic, and accompanying him is the Prime Minister. Willie is brought out, panicking as usual, although understandable in this instance. When Willie is strapped into the cage, there's a bit of variation. Molaram does not in fact rip her heart out but calls for Indy to come over. Willie tries to reason with the possessed Indy, but he just brushes her off, and the ritual is about to begin. In the meanwhile, Short Round who was sent to the mines disobeys the slavers, and uses his mining tool to instead break his chains. Looking out, and working at it for a few minutes, he eventually breaks them and takes the opportunity to escape. Hiding when appropriate, he climbs up a ladder, and then uses the ladder to do a crazy maneuver to get to the ritual fast enough. By the time he gets there, Willie's already been lowered down, and Short Round comes into the ritual trying to get Indy to wake up. The possessed Indy slaps him away, and this brings Short Round to tears. And yeah, I feel ya buddy. Short Round proclaims how he loves Indy as a father figure, and grabs a torch and partially burns Indy with it. This here, is the solution. As Indy wakes up from the inflicted curse, and now regaining his conscious, he pretends to grab Short Round, and winks at him that he's alright, and the two of them kick the cultists' asses. And yeah, this is deliberately set up for a reaction of relief, 
Indy, now a hero again, beats the shit out of the thuggy cultists, and even throws one of them off to his death. Although Molaram escapes through a trap door, Indy proceeds to raise Willie up. And despite an ambush by the Prime Minister, he is overpowered and Indian Short Round save Willy. As such, Short Round hands Indy his equipment. And we get this little moment where Indy puts Short Round's cap on him, affirming that he is like a son to him. So yeah, Indy grabs the Sankara stones with his bag, as well as a shirt, and his whip and so on. And now, it's time to punish the cult for their heinous deeds. Willy begs Indy to get out of here, and Indy responds, Right. All of us. Yeah, that's right. No child left behind except it's better than the George W. Bush policy. Indy shows up in the mines in a dramatic fashion to beat the shit out of the captors, and proceeds to free all the children. Some have criticized this whole sequence for being part of the white savior trope, which is exactly what it sounds like. And while that may be true, I don't think it's done in a derogatory way. Indy saving these children, and no comment is made that they're Indian. Eventually, the Overseer comes out, and not appreciating that he freed all the children, we get a fight similar to the one with the German mechanic. It's the same actors after all. Anyways, the Overseer beats the shit out of Indy, throwing him onto a cart, and intending to crush him under a roller. Adding to the problem is the Maharaja, who is actively using the voodoo doll to harm Indy, such as giving him incredible back pain, among other things. Short Round and Willy see the Maharaja, and Short Round climbs all the way up to him, and fights him to get him off Indy. Eventually, there's a point where the Overseer has the upper hand, and has Indy at his mercy. Short Round manages to get the spike out of Indy's voodoo doll, and Indy manages to get the upper hand on the Overseer, and beats the shit out of him for all the crap he put him through. The Overseer's clothes get caught on the crushing roller, and yep, He's dead. At the same time, Short Round takes the Maharaja out of the black sleep of Kali using the same flame trick. The Maharaja tells Short Round afterwards to use the left tunnel to escape. Getting into a minecart, Willy and Short Round cry on for Indy to get onto their cart to escape. And Indy uses his whip to get over to them while the thuggy cultists are firing shots at him. Although as for the left tunnel escape, well the tracks are changed to the right tunnel. And here we get one of the most impressive set pieces in this film, the minecart chase. This was apparently originally a set piece for Raiders that was scrapped. But Lucas and Spielberg knew for a fact that they would use it for the next movie. This minecart chase is well edited, and the special effects are really good. ILM did a really good job. Throughout this chase, Indian friends take out the thuggy cultists chasing after them, and Willie actually has a useful contribution by punching one of the cultists off to save Indy. However, Mola Ram gets his remaining goons to cause a flood in the mines, in the hopes that it will kill Indian friends. After reaching the end of the mines, Indy and friends get out of the cart, and narrowly avoid the flood. Willy and Short Round make their way up to a high up bridge. Willy is reluctant to go across, but eventually they go to the other side. It's also where we see a whole load of crocodiles that greet you if you fall. We get a call back to the instant gunshot scene, except now since Indy's lacking a gun, he just beats the crap out of the two cultist swordsmen. Although it's a different story when a whole legion of them chase him, and he's forced to run. Although he doesn't make it very far, and neither does Short Round and Willy. Mola rams on the other side, and now Indian friends are cornered by thuggy cultists on both sides, and this is where the climax kicks in. Both sides prepare to approach Indy, with Willy and Short Round as hostages. Indy threatens to drop the stones if they aren't released, but Mola Ram doesn't care if he drops them proclaiming that they'll simply be found again. So what does Indy do? Yeah, you know what he's going to do. He speaks the short round in Chinese to grab onto the bridge, and he informs Willy to do the same. Before he does the deed, he spouts out one of the most awesome one-liners I've ever heard. Molaram, prepare to meet Kali in hell. So he cuts the bridge, and causes it to fall down. Molaram only has barely enough time to grab on before the bridge is split in two. Here, it's a struggle to throw each other off. Molaram actually commits the villain kills his own men cliche by throwing one of his own men off in an attempt to get Indy to lose grip. He gleefully laughs at his goon's demise, even when Indy manages to dodge it. Yeah, that's another case of bad writing. Unless... 
You know what, I'm going to talk about something soon, just bear with me. During the struggle, Molaram tries to rip Indy's heart, although he manages to get his grip off. Molaram tries to get the bag off Indy, and during all this, the three stones boil up, with two of them falling out into the river, with the third being grabbed by Molaram, in which it burns in his hand and he loses grip and falls to his death with Indy grabbing the last stone, fortunately. Now, I think something interesting to talk about is the Black Sleep of Kali and who it applies to. I wanted to talk about this at the very end. Although Indy was possessed by the dark magic and the Maharaja was influenced too, it's reason to ask who else was affected. Was the Overseer actually under the influence? What about the Prime Minister? Or what about Molaram himself? When it occurred to me that any character in the cult could be under the influence of the Black Sleep, it made me think about the movie very differently. I don't know if any other critic has brought it up, but it's a very valid question. In fact, in earlier treatments of the script, upon touching the Sankara Stone, Molaram would be briefly revealed to be under the influence of the Black Sleep before falling to his death. This was cut from the final film, because it would not make for a satisfying death. Rather, a tragic one, as well as having Indy realize he killed an innocent man. However, it's not confirmed whether or not Molaram was actually innocent in the final film. Hence this debate. The original plan for Molaram's death is even featured in the novelization, so I hear. In the film, we're not supposed to think about whether anyone Indy beat the shit out of was actually under the influence of the Black Sleep or not. But once the question is asked, it's not easy to put it down. I think for Molaram in particular, we probably should have gotten a scene beforehand where they confirm without a shadow of a doubt that he is not under the influence of the Black Sleep. I think canonically, based on the changes to the script, Molaram was acting of his own accord. But since it's not confirmed, it's uncertain. And I imagine Indy himself might have pondered on this possibility after the fact. We don't get much information on Molaram's backstory, so this question is left inconclusive. I just wanted to bring this up, as it really bugged me when I started to realise it, and the film's solution is to simply not think about it. However, with all that being said, Indy manages to climb his way up, with the British Indian forces showing up to take out the cultists, and they're stopped as a threat. Indy and friends make it all the way back to the village, with Indy heralded as a hero, with him returning the stones to the village, and the movie pretty much wraps up there, with everyone happy. And that was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Perhaps this was a much different movie than Raiders, but it's still great. Spicing things up didn't hurt anyone. It's believable as being an earlier Indiana Jones adventure focusing on a different culture, and the film's imagination and set pieces are extremely creative. You can clearly tell this film was a reflection of George Lucas having a hard time with his divorce, but despite all that, it worked to the movie's favour, as the shock value is effective, and Indy wasn't supposed to be seen by young children in the first place. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is an effective standalone prequel, that shows us more of Indy, as well as recycling many of the motifs of the first film. This is recognisable as an Indy movie, more than just the returning protagonist, but it still has different locations, characters and villains. Short Round in the Dark content were especially a highlight, and as such, I award Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom a 9.5 out of 10, slightly lower than Raiders, but still, it very much holds its own. Next up, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. May we celebrate the final days before Dial of Destiny comes out and ruins everything. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories with mystery boxes? In the final days before Indiana Jones is forever ruined by the diarrhea of destiny, it's one of the last days to celebrate Indiana Jones while it's still fresh and clean. I've seen the leaks for the upcoming film. It had a horrible ending that was reportedly cut because it was that bad. They wanted to erase Indiana Jones from existence through time travel, and Harrison Ford himself hated the ending. This also would have been a massive retcon, Given Indy is shown to be alive in the 1990s in the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles TV show by George Lucas, that I wanted to talk about eventually, but for now, let us direct our attention to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade.
Before Temple of Doom resurged from the mixed reviews of the time, George and Spielberg were disappointed at how the film was received. So they wanted to make a movie that dialed back to Raiders of the Lost Ark. That probably wouldn't have been my idea, but it's something that worked in the past. It's noteworthy to say that Return of the Jedi was pretty much a movie like this. A movie that tries to recapture the spirit of the first movie. I've said previously that Last Crusade was my least favourite of the indie films. Although that's going to change very soon. And that's because it's the least original. Again, that's going to change very soon. There was always an undertone feeling of, haven't I seen this sort of shit before? I mean, they also try to do things a bit differently, but it's not that fresh, if that makes sense. Honestly, Indy's personal story was great, so maybe they could have tried to have different villains and change up the environments again. That probably would have helped Last Crusade stand out from the other two. I was under the impression that each indie adventure is different, but obviously some adventures are going to share similarities with others. Looking at Indiana Jones as a franchise, the Nazis are the villains a lot of the time in external material, and personally that's fine, but in the mainstream film series, I would have expected a different villainous faction. Like, I know the Nazis are the biggest antagonistic faction, but they literally could have picked from a whole list of corrupt governments, or made up their own faction. I don't know. It rubbed me the wrong way that we're having the Nazis be the villains again. It's because the supporting villains are pretty much the same as the ones from Raiders. You can tell the difference between the cast of villains from Raiders versus Temple of Doom. Pat Roach, for example, played both the German mechanic and the slaver overseer in both respective movies. Both were heavily muscled villains for Indy to take on, but they're both different. The German mechanic was an arrogant dude who picked a fight with Indy, while the overseer was a brutal slaver with no remorse or mercy. They're both brutally killed in their respective fights, but they're distinguishable as well as their factions. If this film ever made a mistake, it was rehashing the villains from Raiders. However, the film's greatest strength is a highlight of the series as a whole, and even the repeated villains couldn't bring it down. I'm just saying they probably could have had new villains, but the start of this movie is actually pretty unique. So without further ado, let's talk about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So the movie starts off in the US state of Utah in 1912, which is over 20 years before the events of Temple of Doom or Raiders. As via Indy's date of birth in 1899, this makes Indy around 13 years old in the prologue. When you realise this prologue takes place in that year, you know we're in for a little origin story. Although to be honest, the opening sequence with the titles on screen is probably the weakest in the whole series. I don't know. In Raiders, it was a hike across the jungle with ominous music. In Temple of Doom, it was a creative musical number. And in Crystal Skull, it was Elvis Presley and Hound Dog all the way. John Williams' score sounds a bit too casual and innocent, if that's the right word. We see Indy as a boy scout with his group. The guy in charge tells everyone to dismount and not to wander off. But you want to know who wanders off? Indy, as well as his chubby sidekick Herman. They go into the mountains and come across some diggers in the area. Indy here is played by the late River Phoenix, who tragically died from an overdose way back in 1993, a mere four years after this film was released. River Phoenix was handpicked by Harrison Ford himself, because he was good at replicating his mannerisms, as well as the fact that he looked the most like Ford when he was his age. I also believe the Boy Scouts thing was based on Spielberg's childhood, but regardless, we see Indy and Herman spy on the diggers, who find the cross of Coronado. Indy explaining that the original owner in question was given the cross by the conquistador known as Cortez. Indy shows his roots here, as the diggers find the cross, intending to sell it to an unknown party. Indy tells Herman with a serious look that it belongs in a museum. There's also this little detail where we see that at this point, he's not afraid of snakes as Herman is the one who is visibly fearful. Indy tells Herman to go and tell the local sheriff about the diggers, while he goes and takes the cross. Yeah, so he sneakily goes down the rope and swipes the cross before going back up the rope. But while climbing up, he makes a noise and the diggers are onto him. He rounds out and whistles for his horse, while the diggers and friends call for their transport. And here, it's a chase, and during all this, they come across a moving circus train. Oh boy. Out of all the things they could have run into, I thought the circus train was kind of clever, as they allowed a lot of unique scenarios to come and go. 
We start with giraffes, and when the diggers catch up to Indy, he opts to go through the carriage with reptiles in it. And it's here where his fear of snakes started, as he lands on a pile of snakes who crawl all over him. And contrary to last time, he hates snakes now. He fucking hates them. We cut to when he escapes, and he's come out a changed man. This prologue gives an origin story to two other of his gimmicks, Just You Wait. As well as this, Indy during all this upsets a rhino, who almost punctures him around the area, and Indy seizes the opportunity to swing to another side of the train, until the digger leader, known in external material as Garth, confronts Indy, until he falls into a carriage with a lion in it. As anyone in this situation would do, he panics, and looks for a means of defense, and comes across his iconic bull whip. He proceeds to grab it immediately, and starts whipping away at the lion, accidentally cutting himself in the chin, which is a neat detail due to the natural scar Harrison Ford has on his chin. The diggers offer to save him by tossing up the whip, and Indy does what he's told because what other choice does he have? Upon being pulled up, Garth tells him to give up, but the defiant Indy tells him that the cross belongs in a museum. He's able to break through due to a snake under his sleeve, and to finish off the circus train comes my favourite part. He enters a room full of magic, but upon realising the door is locked, he goes under a magic box. By the time Garth comes in, he presumes Indy is under there, so he demands for him to get out. But then, presto, he's gone. He goes out of the carriage and sees Indy running away with the cross. He curses under his tongue, but you can see that he has a smirk of admiration. Indy runs into the house, calling for his dad, and we get a taste of the early relationship Indy has with his father. That being that his dad isn't the greatest father. Indy has something important to tell him, but his dad is far more concerned with writing stuff in his grail diary, which comes full circle by the end. He gets Indy to count to 20. In Greek, of course, and soon afterwards, Herman comes along with the sheriff, playing the bugle. Upon speaking to the sheriff, Indy gives the sheriff the cross of Coronado, and reveals that the owner of the cross, i.e. the diggers, won't press charges if he returns the cross. So yeah, Indy's battle here is lost. This was all a huge waste of time, as Indy has to give up the cross. So with that being said, we see the man in the Panama hat, who was also chasing Indy give the hyperactive digger a check of money, with all others leaving the house, but Garth stays inside for a little bit. As shown visually earlier, he gives Indy a present as a show of admiration, and this is where we see where Indy got his iconic hat. That's actually a pretty interesting backstory, that he was stealing from the guy who gave him his iconic hat. I remember what Solo A Star Wars story was like, and how it was a shitty origin story for Han Solo, or at least, how it was presented, because it was plain stupid. Here, we see that Indy earned the hat. In the next shot, we cut to 1938 around the Portuguese coast, where Indy restrained on a ship is confronted by the man in the Panama hat for a second time. The exchange the two give is excellent, with Indy affirming that the cross belongs in a museum, and the dude responds, so do you, and he gets his men to throw Indy overboard. Although Indy does break free and struggles with the goons before pulling the old man down, Amidst all this is a terrible storm that adds to the tension. Indy steals the cross and then swings overboard as the ship loaded with TNT detonates from the storm and blows up. So with all that, this is an excellent way to start the movie. I'd say it's my second favourite opening, behind Raiders. It's a great start that is much like Raiders and Temple of Doom, but manages to differentiate itself as an origin story to a lot of Indy's gimmicks. After that mini-adventure, we're back to the Marshall College. Now since they're dialing back to Raiders, they decided to implement two returning characters. The first of which is Marcus Brody, who did squat in Raiders. But I can say he's utilised as an actual character here. After Indy's done teaching, in which the class itself is foreshadowing a future scene interesting enough, Brody comes in with Indy delivering him the Cross of Coronado, an artifact which he worked so hard to acquire after that scuffle in 1912. Another reason I like this whole opening of the film is because it makes Indiana Jones' life feel more eventful. It's reason to say that he's always on the move, looking for another artifact or defeating evil villains like the Thuggy Cult. So anyways, 
Indy goes over to his office, but he's overwhelmed and swarmed by students, all pestering him for whatever reason. And Indy has to get past them to get into his office. He realizes they're not going away anytime soon. So to sneakily get away, he climbs out the window and walks outside. However, some men in a suspicious car show up and confront him. They look like trouble. And in the next scene, we see Indy in a fancy mansion. This is where we're introduced to the instigator for Indy's main journey. Although the quest was hinted at way earlier in the prologue, this is Walter Donovan, played by Julian Glover. Anyone familiar with Star Wars also knows him as General Veers. You might have also heard the theory that Indiana Jones was merely a dream Han Solo had in Carbonite. I personally don't like that theory because most of the time, making everything a figment of one's imagination makes for a terrible story. Even when I was a kid, the book Where the Wild Things Are pissed me off by the lackluster ending of It Was All a Dream. But at least the book wasn't that long so I can't be too disappointed at the revelation. Well, point is, both franchises share an actor, except this time Julian Glover has more screen time and a more prominent role. Walter Donovan greets Indy in a friendly way, and at first glance, he seems that way. He apologizes for how his men got him here, but Indy isn't too concerned. He notes how he's donated a lot of stuff to the National Museum of History, and someone Indy would naturally trust in this line of work. Walter tells him that he has a breakthrough in a certain artifact, and shows him an old stone tablet, written in Latin. Roughly half of the tablet is lost, but Indy reads the rest of it, and realizes it hints towards the artifact for this movie, the Holy Grail. From what I remember of the behind the scenes featurette, the Holy Grail was best known for being in the Monty Python film in the 70s. And Spielberg thought it was risky doing the Holy Grail in particular, when everyone thought of that movie when it came to the Holy Grail in pop culture. The Holy Grail in this movie is rather impressive. We don't actually get to see what it looks like until the very end. But it's presented as being mystical just like all the other MacGuffins. Minus whatever the hell the time traveling thing is supposed to be in Dial of Destiny. We mostly see it through drawings and characters talk about it a lot. In the context of this movie, and in real life too, it's noted as being the cup of Christ from the Last Supper. And whoever drinks from the cup is granted immortal life. Walter Donovan affirms this with an excited look. The dialogue discussing the Grail is great. Indy describes this as a bedtime story, and Donovan responds that it's certainly a story he'd like to wake up to, reminding Indy that finding the Grail was his father's dream, although we see that Indy isn't that excited at hearing the mention of his father. Donovan proceeds to talk about another story about how three knights from the First Crusade searched for the Grail, only one returned to France, and spoke about the Grail and whatnot. Donovan speaks about a manuscript they found that proves the knight's story was true. Long story short, Donovan mentions how the project leader suspects that the knight's tomb is located in Venice, Italy. I also like Donovan's line where he says, quote unquote, we're about to complete a great quest that began almost 2,000 years ago. This quote gets me every time. It has so much meaning on putting your place in history and finding a holy relic and so on. Later this line means something darker, but still, it comes across as grand at the same time. Donovan mentions how the main guy looking into the grail has vanished, and how his colleague Dr. Schneider has no idea where he is. Indy suggests that they contact his father, but Donovan reveals that his father is the guy who vanished. Yeah, that's right, his father disappeared. And now this quest means more than just finding the grail. So later that day, Indy heads over to his dad's place with Brody. And what do you know? The place is mysteriously ransacked, and Indy opens a package containing his father's grail diary. He references how it was sent to him, and I remember how he came across this package when he collected it in his office. Seeing all this, and looking at frames in his dad's place concerning the legends of the Holy Grail, Indy has a change of heart, and decides he'll take Donovan's ticket overseas. So before the flight takes, Brody also decides to come along. So just before the flight takes off, Donovan tells Brody that Dr. Schneider has a place in Venice, and to Indy, Donovan tells him to be careful and not to trust anybody. I fucking knew where this was going as soon as I heard this line, but anyways, Indy and Brody fly all the way over to Venice, and the place looks really nice. 
I should know because I've actually been to Venice before. It's a popular tourist attraction in Italy besides Rome. The floating city was also featured in Assassin's Creed 2 and I recognized so many of the landmarks. My family even had pizza which eh I'm more used to the American version of pizza. So anyways searching around for Dr. Schneider they're greeted by the person in question an Austrian woman. They went into Venice thinking it was going to be a dude, but actually, it's this chick. I fucking knew that this was essentially going to be Indy's gal for this movie. Although, as it turns out, there's a price this time. Well, anyways, Elsa Schneider talks about how Indy's father disappeared. She has no idea where he is. And the lead he had on the Tomb of the Grail is near a library. In which Brody comments it looks more like a converted church. Basically, during all this, Indy uses his detective skills using his father's grail diary, as well as Roman numerals in the library. He finds the numbers 3, 7, and 10, proclaiming that when he finds the 10, that X marks the spot, a callback to what he said in his class where X never marks the spot. Well, Indy decides to bash open the ground with a blunt object standing around, and we get a scene where this dude that sort of looks like Mark Twain, stamping books, mistakenly thinks that Indy's pounding is coming from his stamper. For a bit of visual humour. Anyways, Indy and Elsa make their way down, while I suppose Brody stays up as a lookout. The former two in question go to explore the Venetian tomb, and the intrigue here is great. The whole movie manages to maintain a whole form of mystery, right until the very end. As soon as Indy and Elsa go exploring, some dudes, who by their shadowy nature, and obviously spell bad news, come in to intercept the search for the tomb. They knock out Brody swiftly, and it's here where we cut back to Indy and Elsa, in which they make their way through the tomb, encountering a reference to the Ark of the Covenant, which I suppose is meant to be a callback, and come across a little creepy crawly moment when they come across a horde of giant rats, and they have to make it past the unsanitary critters. What's that smell? What? What is that? Is that for rats or mice? Look at them all! They hike across the rat infested area and find the Tomb of the Grail Knight, finding the full inscription that was missing in the first half. And the two are joyful over finding the pivotal clue. And it's here where Indy mentions that his dad would have never made it past the rats. Because just like Indy's phobia of snakes, he fucking hates them. However, the mysterious men light a fire in the catacombs, Obviously in an attempt to kill Indy and Elsa. Well, Indy and Elsa manage to escape the catacombs getting caught on fire and swim out onto the streets of Venice. But the mysterious men, determined to kill both of them, chase them outside. In which Indy starts a speedboat for the both of them to escape. And it's another chase sequence. The group of men chase the pair across Venetian waters, in which Indy in a classic fashion beats them up. There's actually a part where Elsa mishears Indy to go in between two ships, and this is a mistake that almost gets them crushed. Around taking out one of the boats chasing them, it leads to a confrontation between the last boat. And I really like John Williams' score here. Very dramatic and intense. When Indy's about to take out the last guy, in which the last guy responds that they're looking for the Holy Grail, Indy asks whether or not they killed his father, given he was looking for the grail too, in which the dude responds no. It's here where Indy is given a choice of sparing the dude, or they both die. He ultimately prepares to spare the dude, in which he demands to tell him where his father is. Upon being questioned, the man tells Indy that his name is Kazim, and he's part of a secret society known as the Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword, an organization dedicated to keeping the Holy Grail safe and hidden. He asks Indy a question on why he seeks the Grail. Is it for his father's glory or his? And Indy responds that his goal is to find his father, in which Kazim tells him that his father is held captive in Bronwald Castle, located around the German-Austrian border. Now I have to question given what's revealed later, but I'll save it for when the revelation comes. We cut back to Elsa's place, in which Indy and Brody have a look at the inscription, which completed, reveals that the Grail is located around the city of Alexandretta, which no longer exists, instead replaced by the city of Iskenderun, probably butchered that name, and they piece together through his father's grail diary that his father figured out the path to the canyon of the crescent moon where the grail is located. 
except he had no idea where to begin the trail. Well, now that they know, Indy sends Brody to go to the city in Turkey, while he intends to go look for his father. This is around the time the romance between Indy and Elsa starts, as they basically embrace each other. Kind of rudely. So I presume they slept together off screen and then took a trip from Italy to Austria by car near Salzburg. So to describe the whole Venetian sequence of the movie, it's still pretty good. The mystery plot and the engagement I had in seeing Indian friends piece things together was interesting. As well as it direct feeding us with even more mystery to be solved. Because what are stories but mystery boxes? I'm so sorry. When Indy and Elsa arrive to the castle in question, it's raining, and Indy has a plan to enter the castle. He and Elsa swap hats, in which Indy puts on this really silly Scottish accent. The dude at the door has all of his questions deflected, and his face eventually smacked cold. And now it's here, where we find out the villainous faction for this movie. The Nazis. Again, I'm saying it like that because YouTube doesn't like how it's actually pronounced. So you've already heard my complaint about this movie. When you're making a trilogy, you've got to make all three entries stand apart in some way. And Last Crusade was made with the mentality of, let's make a movie that feels like the first one, which is perhaps the biggest mistake it made. And yes, my criticism falls on both Lucas and Spielberg. It's easy for anyone to vilify the Nazis. Like for Christ's sake, the officers have skulls on their hats. That's how you know they're the bad guys. And top it with historical context and yep, the man with the silly mustache ran a tyrannical regime that targeted many, many people. Even though the faction and the ideology itself was destroyed and largely discredited forever, the damage it did cannot be undone. It made the country of origin, Germany, a stain that cannot be cleaned. Ever as well as setting back natural progress decades. For example, the silly mustache man's regime targeted the Institute for Sexual Science, a progressive organization way ahead of its time, which researched heavily into sexuality. And yes, that includes the gay community. You want to know what happened to it? Well, silly mustache man happened. And he shut down the Institute and then arrested the main dude, Magnus Hirschfeld, for being Jewish. All the potential progress made for gay rights was obliterated, and it only started to pick up again around the 90s and 2000s, I'd say. Of the countries that legalized gay marriage, mostly in the West, it was either the 2000s or 2010s. Silly mustache man happening was one of the worst things that happened ever. I think I'm getting off track, but I just wanted to vent some history about why the Nazis suck, and how such a fanatical regime made things worse. Now I'm not saying they can't do the Nazis ever again, because I'm fine with plenty of expanded universe stories having them, such as the video games, comics and novels, but you'd think they'd try to make the main series more unique? Like after Temple of Doom, Indy was going to be a franchise no matter what. So you'd think you'd totally inspire a new faction to introduce into the series. Not only to make the third movie stand out, but also to inspire other authors. I don't know who could have been the alternate bad guys in the 1930s or 40s landscape instead of the Nazis. But you could easily make up a faction like the Thuggy Cult. They did the Soviets in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and leaned towards more 1950s stuff. So it annoys me that we're just doing the Nazis again. And they're not unique with the same antagonist. They're having the Nazis search for another religious artifact. Last time, it was the Ark of the Covenant. This time, it's the Holy Grail. There's some stuff regarding the repeated antagonist I do like, but the rehash villains make the movie more predictable, if that's the right word. We all know that Indy's antagonists are going to die at the end. We know that like Raiders, Indy's going to beat the shit out of them, and the Nazis are going to play the same role as the first movie, just with a different MacGuffin. I don't know. I sort of dropped a little bit of interest when I saw the fascists again. Making Last Crusade Indy's most personal story is what prevents it from being a lame rehash all around, but still, I'm disappointed about how much they tried to replicate Raiders. Especially after seeing how different Temple of Doom was. I was given the impression that each movie had a different flavour to it. Raiders was basically the anti-Nazi vengeance movie, and Temple of Doom was the literal dark cult classic, and so on. Indy's personal story makes this movie stand out from the others enough, but I wish it was more different. And having the Nazis be the villains again was a mistake in my opinion. With how Temple of Doom managed to set itself apart, 
while still being as consistently enjoyable, even if the first one is better, I'm kind of disappointed. I could already predict certain elements of the movie. Also, since they're bringing Marcus Brody and a certain someone back, it felt too much like a callback. I expect Dial of Destiny to be much, much worse with its rehashing, but I just wanted to give my take. So I'd just say that around 30% of The Last Crusade bummed me out with the presence of the Nazis. So anyways, the Nazis are the villains again. Indy remarks how he hates these guys, and it's meant to be a callback to Raiders. Something I don't quite understand though, is why they don't really have callbacks to Temple of Doom too. Like a reference to that movie would be welcome too if we're also referencing Raiders. I don't know. It's just that the standalone nature of Temple of Doom has me think that Indy changed its identity and formula come Last Crusade. Indy sneaks around the castle with Elsa, and it's here where he discovers where his dad is. Behind a wired door. So he goes to the next room over, and whips his way to his dad's room, leaving Elsa behind, telling her to wait. He busts into his dad's cell essentially, and before we get to see his face, his dad smashes him over the head with a vase. Now this is Henry Jones, played by the late Sean Connery, rip legend. And in one of his most iconic roles aside from James Bond, he plays Indy's dad. And what a dad he is. Yeah, so Henry Jones is shown to us as an older version of Indy, who definitely shows his age. Being the father of a man in his late 30s after all, which fun fact, Harrison Ford and Sean Connery are less than 10 years apart in age, but Connery easily passes off as an older man. Still though, even though both actors knew they were relatively close in age, they still convincingly play a father and son. Despite Indiana Jones being an American man, his dad is Scottish as per the nationality of the actor playing him. Just like Short Round being Chinese, I think Henry Jones having an American accent wouldn't be as special. Even if it was Sean Connery's hypothetical American equal playing him, or Connery got an accent coach. I don't know. In general, the characters in Indiana Jones are actually pretty diverse in nationality. Let's list off the main ones. Indy is American, Henry is Scottish, Brody is English, Belloc is French, the Nazi villains are German or Austrian. Most characters after Temple of Doom's prologue are Indian. Short Round is Chinese. Salah is Egyptian. Kazim is Turkish. The Soviet villains are either Russian or Ukrainian. In the case of Arena Sparko. Yeah, we've got a lot of national representation here. I know Indy isn't politically correct, but you've got characters from all sorts of different countries, not just from the West. Yeah, I know Indiana Jones is white, but he's quite the multiculturalist, making friends from all around the world, people with different backgrounds, nationally and culturally. Well anyways, Henry refers to Indy as Junior, and Indy responds, yes sir, which is how their interactions usually go. As Indy's recovering from the injury on his head, his dad doesn't apologize at all. He just examines the vase and talks about how he broke something so priceless, until he realizes it's a fake and he's more relieved that he didn't break something expensive. That might sound douchey, and it is, but it's presented in a funny and light-hearted way. Sean Connery nailed it. Well, actually, he does apologize afterwards, but it's in a line of passing dialogue. Indy brings his dad up to speed on what he discovered in Venice, and we even see him be as giddy as a schoolboy, as Indy proudly announces what he found to his dad. Of course, Henry says he wishes he was there, until being told that there were rats all around. Based on what's said, their mutual happiness is about to go sour. When Henry talks about how he wanted to get the diary as far away from him as possible, and Indy has this priceless look where he tells the camera, Oh fuck, I brought the diary here. Seconds later, the Nazis swarm in with guns, demanding he give up the diary. And given that they're both called Dr. Jones, the two jinx each other when addressed. But Henry laughs in the Nazis' face, affirming that his son would never be stupid enough to bring the diary back. But he slowly realizes his captor wasn't joking in the slightest. Indy brought the diary with him right into the arms of the enemy. So the two have a brief argument, but Indy does use it as a distraction to beat the shit out of the Nazis who threaten them both at gunpoint. That's one way to take out some fascists. I also want to mention Henry's famous line after he realizes his son brought the diary back, saying, quote, I should have sent it to the Marx Brothers. Turns out that was referencing a group of Jewish comedians. 
who would very much stay far the fuck away from the domain of silly mustache man. I'm not very familiar with 1930s pop culture. I mean, I saw Scarface, no not that Scarface, the original one directed by Howard Hawks, that was later remade in the 80s with Al Pacino in the lead role. Point is though, I always wondered for the longest time who the Marx Brothers were supposed to be. Anyways, Indy goes back to get Elsa, and it's revealed here passively that she's a nazi. Although supporting antagonist Colonel Ernst Vogel, introduced in this very scene, threatens Elsa's life. Henry tells Indy not to trust Elsa, but Indy doesn't listen, and instead throws away his gun to save her. And he finds out the hard way that she practices the salute. Well that's a way to make Indy's love interest this time around different, making her one of the villains, and it's done well. It gives Indy a dilemma on how to approach someone he's grown to care about, but also hate because she betrayed him. It makes things as personal as someone like Belloc in a different way. Anyways, since Indy gave up his machine gun, he's captured, and he finds out who the main bad guy is. And to be betrayed once again, it's Walter Donovan. Before it's directly revealed though, Indy asks how his dad knew that she was a nazi, and in a completely improvised line, Henry remarks that she talks in her sleep. Yeah, that's right. Both father and son have a bitch in common. Gross. I'm also not kidding that this was a line Connery came up with. It made everyone laugh on set, so they kept it in. This is also tied into Donovan's earlier line, because as he reveals himself, he reminds Indy on what he said about not trusting anyone. Yeah. Walter Donovan, as it turns out, is a traitor to his own country. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's an issue I sort of noticed in relation to Kazim's exposition. If Kazim knows where Henry is being kept, then why didn't he elaborate that the Nazis were the ones holding him captive? And as well as that, wouldn't his organization know about the people looking for the Grail, like Elsa and Donovan? Okay, maybe not Elsa given she was a double agent and not higher ranked in the exposition, but surely Donovan? I don't know. I guess they wanted reveals to happen at the detriment of the thing making sense. It's very important information Kazim left out. Thinking about it, it is a valid question that comes to mind. However, that's an infrequent case of bad writing this movie has. Fortunately for the both of them, Indy had the foresight to rip out some of the pages and gave them to Brody. Although Henry points out that he sticks out like a sore thumb, but Indy taunts Donovan that Brody's a master of hiding and they'll never find him, blah blah. We cut straight to Brody in the city, where he's greeted by Sulla, who you should also remember from Raiders. Sulla is well utilized in this film. Brody, like Donovan said, doesn't do a good job of keeping a low profile. Some Nazi agents catch Brody and Sulla instantly, and there's this exchange where Sulla tries to speak to Brody in code to run, but he doesn't catch on until Sulla is forced to punch one of the German agents and yells for him to run. Although Brody is eventually driven by a truck he tried to hide in. Little nitpicky here, but despite the speed of the truck being slow enough to run after, Sulla just looks on in defeat. Like, come on, I'd be running after that truck, grabbing on and telling Brody to jump. Yes, I would love a self-insert character for this adventure, but that's what night dreams are for, since I commonly dream about being a part of whatever fictional story. Hopefully after I publish this video, I'll dream about accompanying Indy in one of the movies, but no Dial of Destiny. We cut back to Indy and Henry tied up, and Vogel orders Elsa back to Berlin, and Elsa decides to give a seemingly final goodbye to Indy, although Henry talks to her too. She kisses Indy passionately, and tells him that's how Austrians say goodbye. If you remember the movie well, you know that as soon as she walks away, Vogel shows Indy how they say goodbye in Germany specifically, and it's a hard punch to the face. Out of all of Vogel's lines, this has to stand out as the most memorable. This is one of my favourite lines in the movie in general, maybe in the entire series. If there are any Germans watching, please tell me in the comments if you've ever knocked out someone when saying goodbye. Because I imagine Germany is the country with the most concussions. Jokes aside, they're stuck in the large room, and Indy tries to figure out a way to break free. So he proceeds to get his dad to reach into his pocket for his cigarette lighter. Wait, did they just forget to pad Indy down for weapons? Okay, that might be another case of bad writing. I guess it doesn't do much because Henry quickly drops the lighter and accidentally burns the carpet. Yeah, that's right. He makes the situation worse. 
They try to move away from the fire, but they're quickly caught onto by the Nazis. However, Indy is able to break himself free and his dad, and they counter trap the Nazis inside the burning room. They probably died a horrible death, but nobody watching cares. Unless you're a neo-Nazi hate watching this, because you believe Silly Mustache Man did nothing wrong. Well anyways, Indy and Henry make it outside. Indy sets the speedboat off while planning to use the motorcycle. And I actually have the Funko Pop of that. I figured I wanted both characters, so this was the perfect solution. Anyways, when Vogel and his men make it outside, they hop on the speedboats, and the Jones boys speed past on a motorcycle, hitting racist and more racist on the way. Yeah, those are my nicknames for those two goons. It's another chase sequence of outrunning the fascists. To be honest, I said that the movie in relation to the villains kinda drags it down. It's not as interesting as Raiders. And while the chase is enjoyable, it's not as consistently enjoyable. I suppose I prefer it when Ford and Connery play off of each other for the rest of the movie. There is a part where Indy jousts a biker Nazi with a flagpole, but this scene kind of feels like a chase sequence from Raiders too much. I guess the change of scenery is nice, but that's about it. I don't have much to say about this sequence. So let's just skip to when they successfully evade Silly Mustache Man's border patrol. Because they're on the German-Austrian border after all. Indy is headed for Brody's erection, but Henry tells them to stop and says that they need to go get the diary, which Elsa has in Berlin. And Henry explains that it's not just the map they need, but there's also other important stuff in the Grail diary such as tips they'll need when they get to the side of the Grail. There are three trials one must do in order to get to the Grail, but when asked by Indy, his dad has that look. Henry doesn't remember. He wrote everything in his diary so he wouldn't have to. Ha ha ha! That actually makes sense. Sometimes you can't remember everything, so you write it down. The Grail diary was pretty much a cheat sheet posing as a journal, wasn't it? Indy responds how Brody is also important, but Henry simply remarks how Brody would agree with them. Indy swears Jesus Christ under his breath, and his dad slaps him for blasphemy. Henry then explains in his first serious moment, and the music changes in tone too. Brilliant exposition if I have ever seen it. The quest for the grail is not archaeology. It's a race against evil. If it is captured by the Nazis, the armies of darkness will march all over the face of the earth. Do you understand me? Henry trying to get Indy to understand the stakes of finding the Grail. The closest speech I've seen in a fictional story is also a franchise that has Nazis as the antagonist and elements of the occult. You sure kill that big fucking monster proper, BJ. The biggest one is still out there. This may be our last chance to topple the Nazi Empire. Now it's time to get it done, eh? And the world is counting on us and all that. No pressure. <laughs> I don't think it's any coincidence the modern Wolfenstein developers are working on an Indiana Jones game. Out of all the studios, they actually seem like a good fit. There's a lot of similarities between Wolfenstein and Indiana Jones. Yeah, I'm really a fan of fictionalized World War II shit. Anyways, Indy decides to listen to his pa and drive to the capital of Germany. As such, we are met with the center of all the hate. It's a parade of book burnings and touting the fascist flag all over the place. I presume they tracked Elsa off screen. Maybe Indy had friends or contacts in Berlin. And maybe it's explained in the novelization. Point is, Indy dresses in a Nazi uniform and confronts Elsa. Pissed as all hell. He grabs the diary from her pocket, although Elsa plays the victim here, saying that she believes in the grail. But Indy isn't interested in hearing it. He grabs Elsa and threatens to strangle her to death, but you know how Indy is with his bitches. He can't do it, so he just walks away. Well anyways, Indy and Henry try to get out of Germany, but they're swarmed by people with books and pens, clearly wanting an autograph from a certain someone. Yeah, this is where Indy comes face to face with- Oh! Oh my god, it's Hitler! He's back! He's back! Hurry, protect John Stewart! He's our most important Jew! Yeah, silly mustache man himself grabs Indy's book and signs it before giving it back to him. Now Henry's Grail Diary is worth something to neo-Nazis if it's still around today. 
Well, anyways, Indy and Henry go to the Berlin airport, intending to take the first flight out of Germany. They go with manufactured passports, which implies my theory about Indy having friends in Berlin, who probably made some fake IDs for him, and his dad. They go into a Zeppelin, or a blimp, whatever, and for once it seems they can relax. But since escaping Deutschland is no holiday, of course Vogel shows up, and has a search for Indy and Henry. Indy disguises himself as one of the flight staff, and just as Vogel is about to catch Henry, Indy punches him out of the Zeppelin, where he falls into his luggage, as the aircraft takes off. Yeah, there is some of the crappiest green screen in the whole series, as Vogel shakes his fist at Indy and Henry, although you can tell he's not really there. Well, anyways, Indy and Henry can finally get out of Germany, in which they discuss a lot. This is where Indy sort of calls out his dad for never being a good father. Henry gets defensive and proclaims that he was a great father because he minded his own business and taught him self-reliance. Indy snaps back, obviously, by saying that all he ever taught him was that he never mattered enough compared to people who died a thousand years ago. Yeah, it's shown that Henry isn't the best father once again. He was never abusive, but he wasn't supportive either. He was just there. He was a guardian for Indy, but never someone who took the time to support his son on anything he did. I know I can't relate to this because my parents were great, being supportive and caring. My dad was a lot calmer than my mother, but my mum was often overworked and still is come to think of it. I'm like 20 years old, and I've never had a lasting strain with my parents, but I imagine a lot of people in the world have. It would have been nice if Indy had a supportive father, but he didn't. And his mother, as referenced earlier, wasn't around for most of his life, dying of an unspecified illness before the prologue of this very movie. This is what I mean where I say this is Indy's most personal story yet. The second most personal was probably Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, because you know it concerned his son. But here is where Indy faces the toughest relationship, that being with his dad. Although Indy isn't sure what to talk about specifically after a certain point, so his dad presents him with the three challenges of the grail. Test 1. The breath of God. Only the penitent man will pass. Test 2. The word of God. Only in the footsteps of God will he proceed. Test 3. The path of God. Only in the leap of the lion's head will he prove his worth. I love how these three tests are worded. Very majestic. However, the Zeppelin turns around and Indy and Henry need to escape. So they take a plane attached to the Zeppelin and flee. They are pursued by Nazi pilots. Henry also doesn't pick up on military clock cues, and he accidentally shoots off a vital piece of the plane, and they're forced down to the ground. So the Jones boys in the countryside pull a Grand Theft Auto on an old man and drive off, still pursued by the pilots. One of the pilots follow the pair through the tunnel and dies unsurprisingly. The other pilot tries to bomb them, but Henry has quite a unique way of taking out the second pilot. He uses his umbrella to get a flock of birds to cover the view of the pilot, in which he can't see and, yep, he's dead. Henry talks about what he just did, and then we cut to the Republic of Haite, or Haite, I don't know how it's pronounced, in which Donovan gets the Sultan or whoever to give him free reign, along with an escort to the Grail, and the Sultan in return gives him a top-notch car for the time. It's also here where we see Kazim again, blending in and watching the Nazis and the Sultan. Indy and Henry meet up with Sulla, in which they decide to tail the Nazi-armed escort, and Indian friends observe the escort from a distance, although Donovan notices their presence through refraction or whatever, and orders his tanks to fire at them. Yep, now Indian friends have no transport. That's when once in a while, Indian friends have an unlikely distraction to help them. Kazim and his secret brotherhood buddies ambush the Nazi escort, buying Indian friends the time they need, although Kazim is killed in the process. In his last words, he tells Donovan and Elsa that as a messenger from God, may damnation claim the unworthy with the cup of Christ. Henry tries to rescue Brody by himself, but he's captured by Vogel and his men. So now it's up to Indian Sulla. I like Henry's line where he remarks that fascists like him should read books instead of burning them. Then Donovan comes by and tells Vogel that Jones is getting away. Vogel tells him that he thinks not. 
until Donovan points out that he means the other Jones, and cue the classic Indiana Jones theme. Now, I'm not a big fan of the chase in this scene. It's a lot like the one in Raiders of the Lost Ark, and there's nothing that makes it truly different, which is sort of why I wish they didn't rehash the Nazis. If there was ever an example of the repeat villains hampering this film, it's this scene. It's the same shit we've already seen before. Indy pursues Vogel's tank and manages to free both Brody and his dad. I suppose I do like the part where he shoots a couple of Nazis with one bullet, but anything I said about Raiders' chase sequence with the Ark Escort applies here. Except for maybe the fact that they don't have the MacGuffin yet. I will say that I like how this ends. With Indian Vogel still in the tank, Indy jumps off screen, but Vogel, still in the tank, falls over the cliff and dies horribly. And at first, Henry, Sulla, and Brody think Indy perished along with them. And it's here where we see Henry did truly care for his son despite his estranged relationship. Thankfully, Indy was fine, although he's exhausted, and lost his hat, although he does find his hat eventually. And now it's onto the canyon of the crescent moon. Yeah, that's right, we've got the finale. Donovan and the remaining Nazis make it to the Grail site first, although Indian friends are not far behind. Upon Indian friends reaching the site, they spy on Donovan, as a volunteer tries to make it past the first test, the breath of God. Only the penitent man will pass. Is this random guy penitent? Well, I mean, he does regret having volunteered to step forward, and he does see that the other two guys before him lost their heads and soon gets his own head sawed off. Yeah, this is the closest I get to feeling bad for a random villain in an Indiana Jones movie. Donovan also dismisses his death by asking for another volunteer. Although Indian friends are held at gunpoint and exposed to Donovan, Donovan, in a snarky, smug voice, tells Indy that he's going to get the grail for him. He also shows that he doesn't care that he's betrayed his country. But he shows how low he can go when Indy points out that shooting him won't get him anywhere. And Donovan agrees. So he shoots his dad instead. Not in a spot that kills him instantly, but in an area where he will bleed out eventually. Yeah, that's where Indy is forced to go get the grail because it's the only thing that can save his dad. So that's where Indy has no choice but to help Donovan get the Grail. Indy repeats the line from the Grail diary, and dodges the blades by ducking and rolling, and turns off the mechanism. He realizes he needed to kneel before God, and the thing was, penitent means being regretful of doing something wrong. So that's the first obstacle out of the way. Slow and tense, and right as the blades come, Indy ducks in time. Although the second test seems more passable realistically, it's still dangerous. In this test, Indy realizes he has to spell out the name of God, Jehovah, except he needs to spell it out in Latin. He makes the mistake of doing it in English, stepping on J first, and almost falls to his death. He realizes what he actually has to do, and so he spells out God's Latin name correctly. Lastly, the path of God. Only in the leap of the lion's head will he prove his worth. Otherwise, it's a chasm without a bridge across. Brody reminds him that he has to act quickly, and his dad tells him quietly that he must believe to complete the test. He believes he can make the leap, and is rewarded by an optical illusion bridge that he can stand on. Eventually, he enters the resting place of the Holy Grail, and in comes a minor character with great impact. As referenced earlier in the movie, one of the Grail Knights stayed behind, while his two brothers went out. The Grail Knight is here, still alive, but old and frail. He is played by the late Robert Edison, mostly known for stage productions. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade was one of his last roles before passing away two years after this film released. He was 83 when he died, so yeah. Pretty damn old. It's shown that the Grail Knight has stayed in this site for over 850 years. The Grail Knight does try to give up his sword to Indy to pass him down as the new guardian of the Grail, but Donovan and Elsa come in, with Donovan holding a gun. He notices that there's many cups, and asks the Grail Knight which one it is. The Grail Knight simply responds that he has to choose the right one, but he must choose wisely. Picking the wrong grail results in death. So this is where Donovan has to rely on Elsa to pick out the right grail. 
Something I don't quite understand is why wasn't he more cautious about picking out the right grail? I say this because since there's a lot of them, it could be any one of them. Now I understand that he wouldn't want to force Eni to pick it out and test drink it, because obviously his enemy would then be immortal, but Donovan could have... I don't know, threaten Brody or Sulla's life and get Indy to pick out the right grail, otherwise he dies. In fact, I don't know why he didn't just execute Indy here. He served his purpose. Donovan was such an imposing, treacherous villain since his introduction, but his demise kind of just falls flat because he wasn't careful enough. He trusts Elsa to pick out the right grail, and you can tell it's obviously the wrong one, but Donovan finds it beautiful and majestic. And yeah, it's a nice cup, but upon drinking from the grail, thinking he'll get eternal life, he deteriorates rapidly and becomes a skeleton in seconds. Only late 80s special effects could make it look this creepy. Andy pushes Donovan's corpse away from Elsa, and yep, he's dead. But does anyone care? Nope. He was perhaps the second most ruthless Indiana Jones villain, behind Mola Ram. Provided Mola Ram isn't under the black sleep of Kali. But anyways, the Grail Knight remarked that he chose poorly. So Indy has to pick out the right Grail, in which he searches through the cups, reasoning that if it's not the prettiest cup in the lot, it must be a cup that is realistic for the time. He picks out a specific cup, noting that it's the cup of a carpenter, which I presume Jesus was because I don't know much about Christian law. But anyways, he takes a sip, and yep, he picked the right one. He quickly rushes to his dad's side, and pours the water from the cup on his dad's wounds, instantaneously healing him, and reversing Donovan's inflicted bullet wound, and the two hug. Now the Grail Knight said while the Grail does give immortality, it isn't allowed past a certain point. Well, who would ruin it but Elsa? who gets a little greedy and tries to take the grail past that point despite Indy's warnings. She doesn't listen and the whole site crumbles apart, invalidating Indy's and Henry's immortality. Oh well, maybe they can retrieve it and put it in a museum? Well the thing is, the grail is dropped amongst the place falling apart and rumbling. Elsa drops it and almost falls to her death but Indy catches her, trying to get her to give him her other hand. She doesn't listen, the glove slips off, and yep, that's the end of Elsa. Although Indy almost falls himself, although he almost makes the same mistake, as his father does catch him, but Indy is tempted by the Grail too. Henry by this point shows that he cares more about his son than the Grail, and calls him Indiana, the first time in this film, and tells him simply to let it go. I remember Spielberg describing this moment as Henry getting his son to realize that he matters more than the Grail. So Indy breaks out of his temptations and Henry is able to pull him up and they escape from the temple. And before leaving for good, the Grail Knight waves them goodbye, deciding to go down with the temple. Once outside, Indy looks on, obviously thinking about Elsa. And his father tells him something important about her. Elsa never really believed in the Grail. She thought she'd found a prize. And Henry, despite not possessing the Grail, is satisfied on what he did gain. Reconciliation with his son. Anyways, they get on the horses, ready to be off. With Hindi referring to Indy as Junior again. Sulla asks what Junior is supposed to mean, and we get one of the final lines for a long time. In the main series at least until another 20 years. Turns out Indy's given name is Henry Jones Jr. Indy tells him that he has since adopted the name Indiana, and Henry reminds him that the house dog's name was Indiana. Sulla of course jokingly mocks him for being named after the dog, and the four of them ride off into the sunset bringing an end to the adventure, and that was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So yeah, relatively good movie. The story between Indy and his father was one of the best subplots in the entire series. However, the film doesn't cover new grounds for the franchise, and it probably inspired a lot of Indy adventures to just have the Nazis as the bad guys. I wish they tried something different for Last Crusade, because I do truly love the personal story. It's just that the wider plot and the stakes are pretty much the same as Raiders, just with a different religious MacGuffin. This movie was very reactive to how Temple of Doom was originally received. If only Lucas and Spielberg had the foresight to see how Temple of Doom is revered today as a classic, 
different prequel to Raiders. I've said before that I thought that Last Crusade was the weakest, and that's true. It's still an easy 8 point something out of 10 movie, probably even in the late numbers approaching a 9, but it's the mistake of repeat villains that drags us down a notch. Still though, the film manages to hold up despite its big flaw, and it in no way ruins the movie. So now with the original Indiana Jones trilogy complete, and having already done my part to defend Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, it's now our final days before Dial of Destiny comes out, and tarnishes a franchise that was better left alone. It's a miracle Disney left it alone for as long as they did, but now that a new movie's coming out, a movie that drags Indiana Jones down, where Harrison Ford shows his age, and also a stupid time travel plot that doesn't make any sense, as well as doing the nazis for the third time in a major film. I will especially refuse to give them a free pass there. A franchise isn't going to move forward if you don't innovate. That's the key lesson that Disney needs to learn. Helena Shaw is probably going to be the most hated character in the franchise, being Kathleen Kennedy's pretentious self-insert. And I expect very little references to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. In fact, I imagine they'll try to undo a lot of what happens in it. Something I'm also interested in is seeing how they'll butcher it. As the main villain played by Mads Mikkelsen will apparently want to change the past to make sure the Nazis win so he can ensure a future he desires, but he's also going to travel to 1944 specifically, a year where the Nazis were going to lose no matter what. I mean, even without the D-Day landings, they were being steamrolled by the Soviets, so that doesn't make much sense. Shouldn't they go back to 1932 or 1933 when Silly Mustache Man first secured power and oversee World War II with the power of hindsight and prevent the Mustache Man from making the arrogant mistakes he made? By killing Indiana Jones in the past too, that might mean that every plan he thwarted would be prevented as well. So I have to ask, why the hell you would travel to 1944 when the Nazis are obviously losing the war and Silly Mustache Man's fate is sealed? Maybe I'm overthinking an Indiana Jones movie, but no Nazi with access to a time travel device would think of going to the year before the war ended. In fact, depending on when the main bad guy travels in 1944, he might be way too fucking late to save the Third Reich. So yeah. That's why time travel plots have become a huge rabbit hole of plot holes, and why didn't you do this or that? Because of the butterfly effect. Anyways, that's my preview of Indiana Jones and the Diarrhea of Destiny. May Jesus forgive us. I'm JJ Plagiarisms. And until next time, what are stories for mystery boxes? Hello there. I'm the Serial Plagiarist, and today I wanted to talk about something a little bit different, that being the fourth Indiana Jones movie known as Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Just like the prequels, I enjoyed this movie immensely and had absolutely zero idea about the online hatred until I started really using the internet. Looking at surface level reviews, it seems like the haters are just people who want to spite George Lucas, just like the prequels. It's telling given how all the hate is directed at George, and rarely is his friend Spielberg, who directed the movie despite him having to have approved of the ideas George had. When people talk about Spielberg in this movie, they just call it a stinker in his career or something. If the so-called critics were completely fair and unbiased, they would have trashed Spielberg for this movie just as much as George Lucas. But Lucas only got the hate to reinforce the prequel hate narrative. It's lazy criticism. What I want to achieve with this video is to prove the quality of this film and the overblown hatred for the film is undeserved and at best, people should only call it a disappointment if they were unsatisfied after 20 years. That's it. Scratch that, that film isn't a disappointment in any sense. Because this film didn't ruin Indiana Jones or his saga. That's what we'll get into first. So people like to say that Last Crusade's ending was appeaved because of this movie, which is something I highly disagree with. Looking at the Indiana Jones franchise, there are so many other stories with Indiana Jones and it's not exclusive to the films. There's a TV show that exists called The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles that continues the stories of Indiana Jones. So it wasn't like the trilogy ending meant the end of Indy's adventures as a whole. Obviously they were going to do a lot more with the character in the future. 
So I want to go through Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and discuss why it's an actual good movie and a solid entry in the Indiana Jones film saga. So the film starts off without any Indiana Jones. Instead, it's the opening credits that shows us the names of all the actors in this movie. What I think the opening does well is establish the setting. We've moved away from the 1930s and now we're in the 50s, a nostalgic time period for George Lucas and likely Spielberg too. I think this opening establishes the setting and the time period very well. All the set pieces and costumes are immersive. Usually a film never convinces me that it's actually set in the time frame it's set in, especially as we get further and further away in time. As an example, The Thing 2011 never fully convinced me it was in the early 80s because of the haircuts and other small things that were off. Well, in this movie, I am fully sold on the setting. It's very much like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg were returning to the time period. Hound Dog by Elvis Presley may be a stereotypical example, but it's probably the best song they could have used for the opening. That being, to get you excited to watch the movie. So I like the choice in song as it gives an exciting and upbeat start. The story isn't set up until after the intro, but that's okay. Raiders of the Lost Ark's prologue had a completely irrelevant opening when you think about it, aside from setting up one of the villains, but it served the movie. So when the story officially starts, the first thing we're introduced to are the villains. American guards close off Area 51, and the Russians ambush them and kill them all. The big, tough Russian guy is pretty intimidating. He's tall, bulky, and imposing. And given how he's played by an actual Russian, that says a lot. A lot of people assume that all the Russians in the movie are just actors pulling accents, but that's not the case at all. The Soviets, after pushing into the base, throw out Mac and Indy. Indy's reveal I especially like. First, they throw out his iconic hat, and then they throw the man himself out of the car where his face is out of shot, building up to when we truly see the character again. Now, a criticism I've seen online is that people don't like an older Indiana Jones, and cites the reason why James Bond gets an actor swap every so movies is because they want to keep the character the same age. And it doesn't work with Indy because he was originally designed to be the American competitor to James Bond. I don't know why people care about the older Indiana Jones so much. Harrison Ford has the exact same charisma he did all those years ago. And I want to ask something. If they were going to do a movie in the 30s again, then what would they have done? Nazis as the villain doing an occult thing has already been done twice, and Temple of Doom has its adventure be done in Asia. But there isn't much other historical enemies for Indy they could have done, to be honest. Plus, I like that now we've moved on to 1950 serials, where the Soviets are the bad guys. It might seem stereotypical, but it's quite clearly based off actual 1950 serials. As I've said before, this movie is very 50s in feel. This film is practically a modern 1950 serial. Now, aside from that, we get introduced to new characters, as we do with every new Indiana Jones adventure. Indy's got a partner named George McHale, otherwise known as Mac, and in a classic George Lucas trope, the relationship between the two characters is set up by recounting things they did in the past. This ain't gonna be easy. Not as easy as it used to be. Well, we've been through worse. Yeah, when? Flinsburg, there was twice as many. I haven't felt you this tense since, since we fell into that nest of gundarks. Immediately, the relationship is set up. These are two professional partners and friends, and just like Anakin and Obi-Wan, they don't always get along. I've said in my Battle of the Heroes video that two friends in a story don't have to be lovey-dovey with each other to be convincing friends. Friends argue. It's part of interactions. If they were solely friendly the whole time, that wouldn't make a convincing friendship. So I'm glad George Lucas took some cues from his previous work and didn't listen to those stupid critics. The big Russian guy I mentioned earlier, Dovchenko, shows up and punches Indy in the face before we are introduced to the main villain, Arena Sparko, played by a non-Russian, Kate Blanchett. You know, while researching the cast, I came to realize that a lot of the Russian characters with speaking roles were from Russia or other ex-Soviet countries. It's really only Blanchett, the main villain who isn't Russian. 
she's from Australia. Personally, I would want to hire someone who's regionally close to or in Russia, but then I was told it's more about who's right for the role, rather than who's best for regional consistency. I think the criticism that the Russian accents in the film are fake come from people who don't realize that most of the actors are from Russia or from similar regions. I've heard criticism on the film's villains looking past the Russian stereotypes, and I wanted to discuss my take on the matter. Personally, I think the villains in this film are on par with the ones in the Indiana Jones trilogy. If you want to argue stereotypes, the original trilogy had those in some respect. I mean, the main villain is an arrogant, knowledge-hungry agent with the distinction from other villains being her fencing and sword abilities. We've got distinct traits. I've heard the complaint that her character is underdeveloped, which I wholeheartedly disagree with, because her motivation is quite clearly laid out in the film. She wants to use the knowledge of the aliens of the Crystal Skull to win the Cold War. Her motivation was on par with all the other Indiana Jones villains. For example, Walter Donovan wanted immortality from the Holy Grail and aided the Nazis in order to do so. That's literally all his motivation adds up to on the surface level. Walter wanted immortality, Sparko wants knowledge. Like, I see as much depth in Sparko than I do the other Indiana Jones villains. Mostly the other villains in the film are just henchmen. Like Dovchenko, he's just there to be the intimidating tough guy, but it works with how he was designed. With Arino Sparko, I like that she's consistent with how Indiana Jones interacts with women, as her similarities to all his other encounters with female characters. So there's attention to detail there. So moving on, the Soviets open the warehouse, where we get some insight into what the Russians want, that being mummified remains. So Indy comes up with the idea of using the gunpowder to track where the remains are in the warehouse. I like this part because there's proper build up to the discovery. Like the exchange between Indy and Sparko talking about the remains and a vague mention of what it was creates intrigue. And I like the small part where Indy gets shotgun shells from a Russian emptying his gun, which I found to be really cool, especially in the audio department. So another thing to praise is the audio. It's pretty damn good. Like obviously not everyone is going to notice this sound and be like, hey that was a great sound effect. It's the sound effect that assists this particular shot. So Indy helps the Soviets find what they're looking for and hat off to John Williams for composing the score as the music picks up. So it's revealed visually that the main mythology of this movie is aliens. This is yet another big criticism of the film. Now personally, the reason I believe Aliens works quite well in this movie is not just because it's something new, but it goes back into my point about this being a modern 1950 serial. Now I watched the behind the scenes featurettes on this movie, specifically for this video, and basically the Aliens idea went like this. It was George who had the idea to make it Aliens, Spielberg didn't want to do Aliens, not because it was a bad idea, but because he had already made two Alien movies, E.T. and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. George kept insisting on the Aliens idea, citing how it could be like a B-movie like War of the Worlds, which was reflective of the Cold War itself. So just like those 50s Alien movies, it was representative of the setting. This is what I mean when I say the film is very 50s. Now hearing this, people would just use this to shit all over George Lucas, which I still feel is unfair. Because even if Spielberg didn't want Aliens, or the altered idea that was interdimensional beings, he still approved of the idea eventually. And that's very important. He had a say in the movie, and he was convinced of George's idea in the end. Online I've heard the criticism that the film is a mishmash of genres, and I just don't see it. Apparently it's structured like a 30 serial, which I disagree with, given how the film draws inspiration from many 1950s movies. Sure, the archaeology is there, but that's to be expected of an Indiana Jones movie, so I don't see what the goddamn problem is. Anyways, when the Soviets are distracted by the alien, which is glorious to see, I love the props design, Indy steals a weapon for both himself and Mac, and demands they drop their guns or Sparko is dead. And here comes the reveal. Why, Mac? Now, I have two things to praise here. First, the twist villain is revealed very early on. A lot of the time, it feels tedious having a twist villain halfway through or towards the end, so it's a breath of fresh air that the film isn't trying to deceive us. 
Second, I especially love the line where Mac tells Indy why he joined the Russians. He says, Well, what can I say, Jonesy? I'm a capitalist. And they pay. This further establishes Mac's character. He's basically a turncoat on his country and the West. And he doesn't care that the Russians are communists. He just wants money. I find this one line to say a lot about his character. What I think this line also does is further establish the Soviets as the villains. Not because they bribed Mac, but because of their hypocrisy. Communism in the most basic definition, based on what the Soviets followed, is wealth being spread equally amongst everyone. And everyone putting all the work they can put in and take what they need. Obviously the Soviets don't follow this one mindset one bit, as they relied on capitalism and the idea behind it, to bribe Mac into joining him. I mean, it is said by many pro-communists that the Soviet Union wasn't real communism or whatever because they practiced capitalistic ideas too much, so there's a lot said by that one line on a deeper level. Mac also reveals the only reason he lost his money was because of gambling, so it's literally his own fault he's broke. I find this representative of real life to an extent. Lee Harvey Oswald, the widely accepted assassin of John F. Kennedy, was an American who supported Marxism and even lived in the USSR. So anyways, with his friend betraying him, Indy uses the opportunity to throw his gun to the ground and causes the gun to fire at one of the Russians' foots. He uses the confusion to run away. And this is our first action sequence. We see Indy avoid gunfire, Sort of like how he ran fast enough to avoid the traps in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it's classic Indiana Jones actions. How could you be upset at this? They also get really creative with how Indy flees. When he has to carefully step on top of the warehouse on wood beams. Dovchenko eventually catches up to Indy. And they do the old fashioned fight. And damn is it brutal. With Dovchenko using a metal chain to try and whip Indy. Where the sound effects and the sheer force represents the danger. And how much I could relate to Indy. Given I wouldn't want to be whipped with that either. A countdown starts when Indy kicks Dovchenko into a control panel. And it almost seems that Indy is dead when Dovchenko uses the chains to try and strangle him. A minor gripe I do have is the Russians and Mac running towards the missile tester when there's clearly a timer that is a code red warning to get out of the way because only Max survives and all the other Russians get burnt to death. Then we've got the subtle humor of the faces Harrison Ford and Igor Zhizhikin probably butchered that make when the missile goes at an insanely fast rate. It's pretty amusing. So then Indiana Jones, after experiencing the G-force of the missile, barely escapes and hikes across the desert. There, he finds a small town in the middle of nowhere. Now this is part of the movie I also like. Indy goes into the small town and slowly realizes that the place is a nuclear testing site. And what made for an especially clever joke is the bomb being called I Like Ike, which earlier in the movie, Indy said that very phrase. George Lucas's foreshadowing is especially present here, and there's probably many other moments I'm not thinking of. Also, the set they made is impressive, and adds to the humour. Like another complaint of this movie is the overuse of CGI, which of course people would complain about that, but the thing is, there's plenty of practical effects in the film. I especially like the costumes in this movie. The CGI is only used when necessary for over the top set pieces for the film, such as what I'm going to describe. As the nuclear countdown starts, Indy hides in the fridge to protect himself from the blast, which is an extreme stretch logically, but it suits the movie because when has the series ever been realistic? Apparently people use this specific scene to shit on the movie, and I've never understood why. There's plenty of examples of realism being thrown aside. I've actually heard that physicists have said that it's possible that Indy would have actually survived this. And Indy survived a lot. So this scene fits in with the rest of the spectacle. I honestly looked at the scene on YouTube and the top comments gave really positive impressions of the scene. I was heavily expecting people to rip the scene apart, but I got the opposite. Which made me believe that this scene is hated for a reason that is ulterior and to pin the blame of the movie squarely on George Lucas. Plus the scene is iconic. It's been referenced in games like Fallout New Vegas, so there must have been something to it. Like I saw someone suggest it could have been a nearby Fallout shelter, but that wouldn't make for an iconic scene now, would it? 
Nuking the fridge is way more memorable than nuking the fallout shelter. I think the former has a better ring to it. So then we get the scene that establishes more about the villains. The FBI questioned Indy on the fact that he aided KGB agents break into Area 51. This scene establishes with what happened in more detail. Now people do complain that the part of this movie is convoluted because after this scene, we get the usual Professor Jones scene with the Dean, Charles Stanforth. They say how the plot point about Indy being investigated by the FBI is not touched upon much in the film, but I wouldn't say it's convoluted. The scene is basically essentially to set up what's been happening in the past decade, where Marcus Brody and Henry Jones Sr are now dead. Now a well known fact is that Sean Connery was asked for the cameo in this film, but he wasn't interested in coming out of retirement. He declined and George Lucas said it was probably for the best in retrospect because the audience would be disappointed that Henry wasn't coming on the adventure. So with that being said, I disagree that the plot is convoluted because the FBI investigating has a cause and effect where Indy takes a train and we are met with a new character, Mutt Williams. Now I wanted to talk about the cast in this movie. I think every character is well cast. Harrison Ford, as mentioned before, still brings the charm of his character despite the character's age. He was clearly invested in playing the character again after 20 years. This is confirmed in the behind the scenes featurettes because Harrison Ford absolutely wanted to do another movie. On top of Mac being a great character in my opinion, the actor Ray Winstone brings across a charismatic yet snitchy performance to his character. So it's a perfect match. Now I want to talk about Shia LaBeouf now. Shia LaBeouf gets way too much shit as an actor. I looked into the behind the scenes stuff regarding the original Babe Formers trilogy and personally, I think his performance was great. He was supposed to play a teenage boy and the criticism of his over the top panicky performance never really convinced me. Given how Sam Witt Wiki was written, I think Shia LaBeouf was perfect for the role. Of course, the character itself is a different story because he is absolutely a bit of a shallow person in the original Bay Formers trilogy and not exactly hero or relatable protagonist material. Honestly, and this is my brutal opinion, but Shia LaBeouf would have made a great Kylo Ren himself. You stink! Of course, Adam Driver looks absolutely nothing like either Harrison Ford or Carrie Fisher, and Shia LaBeouf does look like Harrison Ford, but there's more to it than that. Seriously, when I think of Shia LaBeouf, I think of some outcast who smokes, curses and drinks, and that's a great fit for Kylo Ren as he appeared in the highly inconsistent sequel trilogy. He literally is Kylo Ren in anything but name. Like most actors play into a personality, but Shia LaBeouf is the personality. It's like when they cast J.K. Simmons to be J. Jonah Jameson in the Spider-Man movies. To date, J.K. Simmons might be one of the finest casting choices ever, and I believe Shia LaBeouf could potentially surpass that, although it's a slim chance, but it's probably the closest we could get. Anyways, what do I think of Shia LaBeouf here as Mutt Williams? Well, I think he's great. Shia LaBeouf watched 50s movies like Rebel Without a Cause to play a greaser James Dean-esque character, the character is kind of obviously, well, you know whose son, but it's not a reveal that breaks the story or makes it a failed plot twist, because the movie is never pretentious about it, or acts like it's the reveal of the ages. We'll get into this more when we get to that part. So anyways, Mutt and Indy discuss Harold Oxley, who both characters know is a fond person they remember. Basically, the mystery of this film is a place called Akator. Indy explains that the Conquistadors called it El Dorado, a place that was thousands of years ahead of its time, and that a man named Francisco de Oriana went missing looking for it in 1546. So with that being said, the MacGuffin of the film, the Crystal Skull, is the main motivation for many of the characters, and Indy explains when Mutt asks him what Ox would want with the skull, that the skull was stolen in the 15th or 16th century and whoever returns the skull gets control over its power, and it's probably the reason Mutt's mother and Ox went missing. It isn't revealed straight away who Mutt's mother is, 
although it's easy to make an educated guess given the marketing and the poster. Well, anyways, two KGB agents show up before the two can even think about helping Ox or Mutt's mother. They are about to take the two away when Andy tells Mutt to punch a letterman, which causes chaos between greasers and lettermen, and devolves into the funniest part of the movie, which is certainly helped by the casual music that plays during the scene. Get that, greaser! <laughs> Mutt and Indy escape by getting on Mutt's motorcycle, and the whole action sequence is another cool part of the movie, because it's totally consistent with the first action sequence, and in the series in general. The whole chase basically has both Mutt and Indy outrun the KGB, and they eventually make it back to Indy's home, that they must go to Peru to find the Crystal Skull. So there's the classic moving overseas sequence. Before they make it to a small town, and after asking around, they discover that Harold Oxley was put in a mental asylum, one that's very poverty stricken, and doesn't seem like it would actually help the mentally ill one bit. Again, the set design is literally perfect. You can tell a lot by this nameless asylum based on how it looks. We get some characterization for Mutt, which starts when Indiana Jones references an episode from the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, where Indy recounts meeting Pancho Villa, which it's good that George Lucas has kept continuity intact and didn't separate from the two stories. So that's a good bit of fan service for hardcore fans. On top of that, we get some insight to Mutt Williams as a character. Mutt discusses how he didn't get along that well with his mother because he quit many schools he was enrolled in. I like this exchange because it tells us a lot about Mutt as a character. And he's sort of like me. I am kind of lazy and disinterested in school, so he's very relatable for someone like me. When Indy and Mutt make it to the asylum, we're told that men with guns took Oxley away, and that all that's left on the trail is his prison cell. Again, the set design is fantastic. We see how Ox has lost his mind, as Indy and Mutt realize he's drawn the crystal skull in every area with the word return in different languages. I also appreciate Mutt's expression here as he looks heartbroken, which further establishes the relationship between he and Mutt, even though we haven't even seen the character yet. So with that being said, Indy and Mutt discover that Ox actually found Oriana's resting place. I love the mystery this film presents. It's honestly better than Attack of the Clones even, to be honest. Anyways, Indy and Mutt go to a grave site and get attacked by native people, I suppose. Native people that are absolutely mental because they attack both of them. Since I've heard zero complaints about this scene, there isn't much to talk about. Probably because there's nothing wrong with this scene. Like, maybe Red Letter Media came up with some nonsense to shit all over it. Speaking of which, I tried watching Plinkett's review on the film, and it was terrible. Offensive jokes, dragged out tangents that say nothing, and random bullshit and nitpicks that aren't even valid as bullshit and nitpicks. Like, the dude clearly missed the point of not only this movie, but the whole series, and didn't consider any nuances. He was just a poor reviewer in general, and of course played out of context clips from the featurettes to slander George Lucas. He's just a fucking idiot as usual. Like, I watched the featurettes as mentioned before, and yeah, he's taking those clips out of context and failing to get the full picture. He didn't even come up with creative insults to throw at George, and just repeated the same crap over and over again. It's just pathetic. Well, back to the film. The fight doesn't last long, because Indy uses a native's blowpipe against him, which is really brutal, and goes against the toned down violence argument. He scares another one off with his gun, and the dialogue is excellent. You're a, a teacher? Part time. So they enter the grave site, and once again, the set design is excellent. It's very reminiscent of the other movies. One of my main praises for the movie is the discovery in the mystery of the Crystal Skull, even though it's clear at this point that it's aliens. The mystery about the alien visitors, why they visited, who they were, where they came from is intriguing, and it definitely kept my attention. So with that being said, they discover the corpses of the Conquistadors. That includes Oriana, where they discover, of course, the Crystal Skull. Discovering that non-magnetic materials attached to it. They also conclude that Oxley had been there twice, once to find the skull, and second to put the skull back. So the intrigue is also there. Anyways, with the crystal skull retrieved, they make it outside where, uh-oh, Mac and the Russians were waiting for them. 
So now they are transported north into the Amazon jungle. Of course, Indy is tied up, where we get some more interaction between Mac and Indy. Mac gloats about saving his life for the third time, and Indy, still pissed about his betrayal, sarcastically says that if he unties him, he'll give him a big hug. I love the dialogue exchange in this movie as I've already made it clear. The conversations characters have are wonderfully acted, but on top of that, are well written. In the spatter between the two, Max says that he doesn't actually care about allegiances, which adds character to him. I'd say that his character is simplistic in concept, but in depth in execution. He's the sort of character I want to see more from. I looked on the Indiana Jones wiki, and aside from being in the Crystal Skull and all associated media, He's only been in one other story, that being a novel called Indiana Jones and the Army of the Dead, a prequel to this movie which is a disgrace. I want more from this character to be explored in the future. Maybe he'll turn up in the upcoming Indiana Jones game made by Bethesda? I can hope. Well anyways, we get this line from Mac that reminds me of Spaceballs actually. It's just about money, isn't it? Oh, not only money. A gigantic pile of money. We're not just doing this for money. We're doing it for a shitload of money. Arena Sparko then shows up, and their interactions are consistent with what she and Indy said to each other at the start. The exchange gives us more information about the aliens, and we get the classic George Lucas trope of foreshadowing. When Sparko goes on about gaining knowledge more important than the weapon that was the nuclear bomb, and Indy tells her and says, be careful what you wish for, you might just get it. I'm sure there are other subtle hints in other parts of the movie, because foreshadowing is a staple of Lucas's work. So now we're introduced to Harold Oxley, the character that's lost his mind. I like how Ox's character for most of the movie, starting with his first proper appearance, represents the threat of the Crystal Skull, because the scene after, Indy is forced to stare into the Crystal Skull, and given what happened to Ox, it makes the scene chilling, because we know it's at stake for Indy's mind, especially since the stakes were set up so quickly. Like, imagine this movie but Harold Oxley is sane for the entire movie, or this part in particular. This scene could have just been a staring contest. This is a staple of show, don't tell. So what I especially like about the staring at the skull scene is the ambience. Indy almost loses his mind before Mac demands that the Soviets stop trying to break Indy's mind and they oblige. Mac then releases Indy and true to Indy's word just a few minutes before, he smacks Mac in the nose. The next scene is the reintroduction of Marion Wavenwood, played by the same actress, Karen Allen. Of course, it's established right away that the two didn't leave on the best of terms, which is consistent with Last Crusade, given how she didn't show up in that one. Temple of Doom is a prequel, by the way. It's also here where it's revealed to Indy that Mutt and Marion are mother and son. Of course, we don't have much time to think about it, because Marion is used as a hostage to get Indy to comply, so the tension is maintained, and the sense of urgency goes on. I remember Plinkett tried to criticize the movie for Indy willfully helping the bad guys, which is just pathetically lazy of him not to realize that in both situations, both at the start and this scene, that the threat of his own life and others prevented them from opposing him. Like at the start, Indy was probably looking out for Mac, and this was at the point before Mac was revealed to be a traitor, and the exact moment after he's revealed to be one, Indy then immediately tries to escape, because now it's only his skin he's looking out for. So basically, Indy tries to communicate with Ox, and he basically realizes that he needs a pencil and some paper, where he then draws symbols that represent where they're supposed to go to find Akator. To keep the sense of urgency, the rebellious Mutt causes a distraction that gets him and his chaps the opportunity to escape. Hiding from the Soviets, both Marion and Indy get stuck in a dry sand pit, and Mutt goes to find something to pull them both out. So it's here where Indy and Marion are alone, and of course, the reveal. Mutt is Indy's son. His actual name is Henry Jones III. I like how his attitude completely changes when he realizes that Mutt is his offspring. Mutt comes back with a snake, and of course, Indy is reluctant to touch the snake because of Aldibiphobia, whatever the phobia is called, as established in the first movie. Grab the snake! I'm calling it that! Do it! Make your dreams come true! Just 
do it! The comedic effect of this scene is excellent, basically because he has to pretend it's a rope to escape. And of course, they get caught because of Ox's instability. Now one thing I should generally say is, people who don't mind this movie, say that the second half is weaker than the first. Personally, I still think it has great merit to it. I mean, instead of being in many locations like the first half, the second half has the characters exclusively be in the Amazon jungle. So I feel stuff like that made people feel this was a weaker half. I haven't really heard a proper explanation on why casual watchers don't like the second half, so this is a completely random guess. What I can say is that the second half definitely has something different to it than the first half, but I believe that it only got a tad bit worse. But the film was good enough to keep that to a minimum. Although the adventure isn't quite as prominent here, I believe the second half does Indy's character arc justice. You see, in the following scene, it's revealed to Mutt that Indy is his father. He's in instant denial, but Marion tells him that the unseen Colin Williams was his stepfather. Basically, Indy's in a midlife crisis because of all the flaws he kept with him throughout his whole life. Indiana Jones is an older man now. It's time that he adapts to his mature age and learns to be a better man. Throughout the original Indiana Jones trilogy, Indy is a heavily flawed character. He's a loose womanizer, he's cocky, he's essentially the Han Solo of his universe. And just like Han Solo in the OT, he must learn to be better. You see, the reason an arc like this didn't happen in The Last Crusade was because Indy was a younger man, around late 30s, while in this movie, he is a 64 year old man. Remember the scene earlier in the movie where Indy talks about the deaths of Marcus Brody and his father? Well, in that same scene, the Dean talks about death and how, as we all get older, life starts taking away more than it gives. So that's another reason why that scene wasn't pointless, despite what people want to say. I mean, it wasn't just like Indiana Jones being older would have meant that he would have just been the same as an American James Bond forever. So that's my two cents on the matter, an observation that George Lucas haters never picked up on. In fact, I believe that Sean Connery's Henry Jones Sr. is exactly the type of arc James Bond would have when he got older. He probably settled down with Anna Mary, that's Indiana Jones' mother, and of course, as we all know, she died of illness as mentioned in The Last Crusade. Just look at Henry Jones Sr. if anyone has an issue with Indiana Jones being older in this movie. So basically, Indy and Mutt knock Jovchenko out, and Indy unties Marion, and we get a brief bit of dialogue between the two. I'm sure I wasn't the only one to go on with my life. There must have been plenty of women for you over the years. Yeah, there were a few, but they all had the same problem. Yeah, what's that? They weren't you, honey. I really like this line, because it shows that Indy cared about Marion more than those other women he screwed. I mean, in Raiders, his relationship with Marion was always the most in-depth one. Given how Marion and Indy knew each other for years, so he knocks out the driver and grabs an RPG and uses it to blow the tree cutter in front. Of course, I don't see anything wrong with the CGI. Like, it isn't the best, but people want to make it out to be the devil when it's really serviceable. Like you guys notice all the practical sets used in the film, right? The CGI is only used for scenes where practical isn't an option. I'm not even sure if I'm giving the special effects enough credit, but of course people complain about the overuse of CGI when just like the prequels, that's barely an argument. Like I've said before, there is such a thing as bad practical effects and good CGI. The following scene is action that is the fight over the skull. With the shredder destroyed, the three hijack a vehicle. And this is probably the textbook example of what people didn't like about the action. Mostly it's people who complain about CGI in the sequence, but I haven't actually heard on why the sequence is bad beyond that. It's mostly a case of the shallow CGI bad, practical good mentality once again. So with that being said, let me explain why this action sequence is actually good. The scene is reminiscent of Indiana Jones fights, but beyond that, the action is great because it follows all the rules of an action scene. It cuts between shots constantly, there's a lot going on with actual consequences beyond the characters' lives, that being stopping the Soviets from reaching Akator and returning the skull to it. When I saw the scene, I felt it was like a modern rendition of the original films. None of the named characters are useless either. They all have something to do besides Oxley, of course, 
because he's lost his mind. Let's have a look at all the characters. Indy retrieves the skull after using the RPG. Marion drives. Mutt faces off against Arena Sparko before getting caught in the vines. Arena Sparko commands the soldiers and faces off against Mutt. Dovchenko gets into a fist fight with Indy later on. The only character that sort of does nothing is Mac. All he does is join the main group after he talks about how his actual allegiance is CIA and that he's actually a double agent spy and whatnot. I remember Plinkett also tried criticizing the film and making Indy out to be an idiot for trusting Mac, but given all I've pointed out, given how Mac literally tells Indy he hinted his true alliance in the tent, and after Mac proves himself to Indy by knocking out a Soviet, I think that's fair enough for Indy to trust Mac. But there's also something else I should discuss. Mutt getting stuck on a vine and swinging with monkeys. Again, I never actually heard why it's bad. The scene is very campy, but so are a lot of other scenes in the original films. All three of them. I don't know why I'm even discussing this. I had to bring it up eventually. Monkeys have been in the first movie, and as I'd like to point out, the monkey in that was highly intelligent and only died because it was indulging on poisoned food. So criticizing the monkeys for following Mutt's lead is ridiculous. I also see another big criticism that the film lacks grit, which I strongly disagree with. The monkey swinging scene might not be dark, but there's plenty of other stuff in the film that are. One example being the killer ants. Basically a swarm of ants come and attack everyone. And damn are they threatening. It's shown that these ants are brutal and lead to a really painful death. Like I wouldn't want to get caught in any swarm of these ants. And they play into the Indiana Jones trope of bugs and vermin. A fist fight ensues between Indy and Dovchenko and I was on the edge of my seat. Because this is probably the closest in the movie that I felt Indy has come close to dying. The fight is surrounded by ants, and given what we know what happens if the swarm gets you, we want Indy to outclass this guy. And when Dovchenko gets caught in the swarm, my god is it brutal. The ants drag him into the ant colony, presumably that he's still alive. Like gee, I feel really bad for the guy, despite him being the brutish tough guy because the pain on his face says it all. Of course, Indy makes it out with the others, and Marion drives off the cliff to escape the Russians. The next scene is essentially a water park ride. As said by Ox earlier in the movie, three times it drops, which I guess was foreshadowing for this scene. There isn't much to say about this scene, because it's basically a sea world attraction. What this leads to is the final stage of the movie, where they finally enter the temple. Given the build up in the film, the payoff I feel is huge. When they enter the temple, we get more information about the aliens. Essentially, they were the ones who kickstarted civilization by teaching the Mayans how to farm and other basic stuff that was pivotal for the creation of modern mankind. The visuals on the walls make this story feel ancient and mysterious, adding to the intrigue. After getting out of the temple, they are chased by native people, and these guys don't fuck around, because they swarm the group and to further add the significance of the crystal skull, when Ox pulls out the skull, just like the ants in their own way, they stay away from the skull, and it lets all five of them proceed. I heard that this was called the worst scene of the movie by one critic, who just nitpicks shit like how native people appeared and other BS that doesn't matter. So with that being said, they make it to a pillar, and of course Max still wants the gold. Indy with his problem solving, realizes that they need to destroy the sand blockers to open the temple. Again, it's naturally progressing the story, and it shows Indy's problem solving, just like in the original films. Well anyways, they fall down the sand once they're done, and they run down the stairs. Again, the set design is fantastic. Oh, the use of CGI my ass. The slowness of the sequence is further building up to the climax, because they use the skull to open the door to the skull equivalent of the Jedi Council, I guess. Mac, of course, reveals to Indy that he, again, is a traitor. Although it isn't really a fake out, because again, they show us that Mac was a spy to lead the Reds. Although I have a theory that at this point, he was actually just trying to lure the Reds and everyone else into the Skull Council while he picked off all the gold. He's a literal interpretation of a gold digger in that case. I also especially love Indy's line when Mac pulls a gun on him again. So what are you, uh, a triple agent? Of course, given that this is the second time, Indy sounds more annoyed than betrayed. 
This is also where shit hits the fan. Sparko is the one who directly reattaches the skull to the missing head, and the overzealous Sparko demands knowledge from the council, which just like what was foreshadowed, she gets exactly what she wanted. The knowledge she sought overloads her mind, and she dies. So as part of my theory that I mentioned a minute ago, Mac is the first one to run out of the room. Ox's sanity is returned, and they all decide to get the hell out of there. And even though Mac betrayed Indy, he still tries to save his friend. And I liked how they wrapped up his story. It's sort of like a subtle redemption for the character. But it isn't direct. Instead, Mac tells Indy that he's going to be fine, and then seconds later, gets sucked into the chaos. I like the final line Mac ended on, because it shows that he wasn't complete, shallow, greedy trash the whole time. With that being said, the rest escape and get washed up to the surface, as they say the UFO take off. Of course, in classic Indiana Jones fashion, they show us the true meaning of the legend. That the treasure wasn't gold, but knowledge. And that the aliens did not come from space, but the space between spaces. Which is a fancy way of saying they're dimensional travellers. Of course, Mutt and Indy reconcile their issues after the adventure they just went through, where Indy pays tribute to Henry Jones Sr. by saying, Somewhere your grandpa is laughing. <laughs> this really touched me, especially now that Sean Connery is no longer with us. So as I've mentioned before, Indy's arc is learning to be a better man, so he finally decides to make himself complete by getting married. Something that he hasn't been able to do in the other movies. He is married at last. Seriously, it would have just been so shallow if Hindi hooked up with another woman for the fourth time. Bringing back Marion was not just fan service. Her character needed to be in the movie for Indy's arc to work. So with that being said, the movie ends with Mutt about to pick up Indy's hat after the wind blows it to him, but Indy takes the hat to reaffirm that he is the one who will always be Indiana Jones. So of course, the classic theme starts playing and the film ends. What a classic new adventure that got all the recognition and praise it deserved. Yeah, right. So this is practically my scene by scene review of Kingdom the Crystal Skull. Hopefully I've made it clear that this is in actuality a gem. Like I no doubt expect people to realize this film's true quality when Indy 5 comes out and is a shallow pandering movie most likely. I'm making this video now so that I can prove that this film was great from the start and people overlooked its qualities to continue spiting George Lucas. Like a lot of people say that George Lucas should have been the idea guy and someone should have written the script and directed the movie. That's exactly what happened here, but they still complain about it. So I doubt that Lucas's involvement is actually the problem here because this is pretty much what prequel haters wanted and once they get it, they still complain about it. It's absolutely hypocritical. In conclusion, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is indeed underrated. People want to make stupid complaints like the overuse of CGI, which is ignoring all the great practical sets the film has. Like, I'm sure that we can all agree that John Williams' score is an instant classic, and far more memorable than the sequel trilogy, but I didn't mention it because John Williams' scores are always good. It was better to point out the actual story, the presentation, the cinematography, the action, and way much more, because that's where the real quality of the film should be. Music is important, but it's also icing on the cake. If you want to argue fan service, Last Crusade has way more. In fact, I wouldn't even say Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is the weakest of the four movies. I'd say that title goes to Last Crusade, Problems I have with it include the fact that it's too reminiscent of the first movie and fan service. Of course, it's still a great movie because the conflict between Indy and his father, the action, the Holy Grail, and of course the brilliant ending that no, it wasn't ruined in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. The reason I made this video is because I want to prove that I've seen George Lucas's other work and say that I know he's a good filmmaker. I will eventually get around to watching American Graffiti, which I look forward to watching. Also, the reason that this video is probably as long as my last Jedi review at this point is, is because to my knowledge, I'm practically the first person to defend the movie in detail. Like other defenders of the movie don't talk about specifics much. They mostly go like, Oh yeah, I understand a lot of people don't like this movie, but I personally do. Because I want to be the person who puts his foot down and uses this film and its quality as its extension for George Lucas and the prequels. So with that being said, 
Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is an automatic 8.5 out of 10. A solid movie on its own and a worthy follow-up to the original films. If you didn't think relatively highly about this movie, then I hope that by watching this video, it will give you another opportunity to watch the movie again. This time, with what I've said in mind. So I've gone on and on about this film. Now it's time to wrap everything up. I'm JJ Plagiarisms. And until next time, what are stories for mystery boxes? Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is perhaps the most insulting thing I've seen since the sequel trilogy. Indiana Jones had a four-way streak of great films ruined by what else but a corporatized mess by Disney Lucasfilm. It's been a miracle that Indiana Jones was left for as long as it was. Because now it's been hampered by this piece of shit. I went to see it the day it came out in theatres, and to say it was disappointment is an understatement. Despite the fact I bought an Indiana Jones hat to ensure my cinema experience was the best it could possibly be, the film breached all-time lows with its awfulness, never seen before in the series. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was a great end to the series, giving Indiana Jones a fulfilling end to his story, he married his one true love, Marion, and he had discovered a son that continued the family lineage, being named after his own father, Henry. It was one way to top Last Crusade, and I don't care what anyone says, I love Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Unfortunately, Disney Lucasfilm, having learnt nothing from the sequel trilogy, repeat the same mistake of brushing Crystal Skull under the rug because the mainstream garbage critics and George Lucas haters condemned it. It's exactly like ignoring the prequel trilogy, aka the first half of the saga, when making The Force Awakens, and had the mentality of, let's do the originals all over again. Here, the same is true. Dial of Destiny pretty much dismisses Kingdom of the Crystal Skull as an afterthought. And that is a big mistake that should not have been repeated. But has because Disney are incapable of learning from their big blunders. If you want to know why we still talk about the sequel trilogy, it is because they have not learned. I think it's all thanks to a certain someone at Lucasfilm. Kathleen Kennedy should have been fired an eternity ago, but it always seems her destructive touch on whatever product makes it go bad. She's had such piss poor leadership skills, having no interest in respecting George Lucas's work, and seems to just spite him if anything. She's more interested with inserting woke politics into the movies, than actually telling a story that's worth a shit. You can tell she meddled in a project every single time if there's some pretentious self insert that hijacks the story in play, and here, we've got exactly that. Helena Shaw was pretty much the secondary protagonist, a character that hijacks the story as a tag-along character, and someone you're expected to like without sufficient reason to. I'll talk more about her when we get into the film, but the point is, is that Kathleen Kennedy forces terrible characters into the films she controls. In all the big projects, she has some sort of woke feminist character that hijacks the story in play. Look to Reva the third sister, who did not belong in the story she was in. The story should have just been about Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader, but Reva just made things terrible. The rematch of the century despite breaking Star Wars lore, and the writers admitted as much, so don't even try to argue that they didn't contradict the films because they absolutely did, would have been so much more bearable without a character like Reva getting in the damn way. People would have tuned in for Obi-Wan and Vader, but why was that so hard to accomplish? Here, it's the same deal. In a movie that's supposed to be about Indiana Jones, she comes out of nowhere and hijacks the film and pretty much made me want to rip my hair out. But again, that'll be for when we get to it. So with that being said, before we assess the movie and play, I wanted to talk about the name of this movie, The Dial of Destiny. This is the worst title I've given to an Indiana Jones story ever, and I'm not just talking about the films. I mean the entire franchise has better names than this final installment. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, Indiana Jones and the Army of the Dead, Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings, etc. Seriously, what the hell even is a Dial of Destiny? Each indie movie has a title that has an indicator towards the story. Another thing Disney Star Wars titles fail to do is even describe what the movies are about. The sequel trilogy is an excellent example, 
The Force Awakens only connects to one line from Snoke. And if we take this line at face value, it shows that J.J. Abrams and friends have no clue how the Force works. The will of the Force, you could say, is always conscious. So what would the Force be awakening from if it's already awake? The Last Jedi is a title given just to be super vague. Does it refer to one Jedi or multiple Jedi? The possibilities are endless. I really hate that they couldn't just give a straightforward title, like Fall of the Resistance or something. Fall of the Resistance is a much better title than The Last Jedi, which is just meant to incite speculation and Rise of Skywalker. Just listen to Kathleen Kennedy explain the meaning of this title. I think The Rise of Skywalker, it doesn't answer anything. It actually, it's provocative, it asks questions, and it could mean a lot of different things. And I think that that's what was important to us. We didn't want to have a title that felt like it was telling you the story. Yep, the title has no meaning. It's all up to interpretation. Also, if we take this at face value, the Skywalkers do not rise in this movie. They fail very, very hard. And Rey Skywalker was not earned, period. In the case of Dial of Destiny, not only is it a cheesy title, but it's got the same purpose as the sequel trilogy titles. That being that it's just meant to incite speculation. The MacGuffin, let me stress, is utter crap. And I really wish they had picked something else. I suppose anything I wish to speak about is waiting in the movie itself. So without further ado, let's have a look at Indiana Jones and the Diarrhea of Destiny. For a 2 hour and 30 minute movie, as in the longest in the series, it sure starts quite abruptly. While it's not the biggest criticism you could give the movie, all the other indie movies started with something to hype you up before the story actually starts. In Raiders it was the hike across the jungle, in Temple of Doom it was the musical number, in Last Crusade it was the Boy Scout hike, and in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull it was Elvis Presley. Dial of Destiny I noticed immediately had no such thing. They just drop us into the story and play right away. And given what the series established, it felt quite abrupt. This did not feel like an Indiana Jones movie. And I suppose there's another elephant in the room to talk about. Spielberg was not directing this, nor was George Lucas coming up with a story. Instead, it was James Mangold based on a story from definitely Kathleen Kennedy, given she forces her input on everything. James Mangold previously directed Logan, which personally wasn't my cup of tea, but in relation to this movie, he apparently touts himself out as a hardcore Indiana Jones fan. But just like Ryan Johnson, I don't believe him for reasons that will become clear soon. Like for one, he's another one of those Crystal Skull haters because of course he is. We can't just get someone who loves all the movies because that would make for an unbiased director, right? I can't believe how out of touch Disney is with who they hire for X movie. I've ripped on Taika with Titi for forgetting that Natalie Portman was in Star Wars and he deserved to be fired the instant he admitted that. Because he's clearly not someone suited to make a Star Wars movie if he couldn't even remember one of the main cast members for three of the major movies. If he was feigning stupidity because he's a prequel hater, then that doesn't spell good news either. Anyways, we start in 1944, in an unspecified location, presumably in Europe near Germany or whatever. Yeah, that's another thing. Unlike other Indiana Jones movies, we don't get a time or place listed on screen. You can piece together that it's late World War II, but it's odd that something you'd come to expect isn't shown. Anyways, that nitpick aside, since it's World War II, and from what we've seen in the trailers and marketing, we get another round of nostalgia-fueled antagonists. That being the Nazis. Pronounced that way because YouTube doesn't like that word. As stated in my last Crusade review, I really did not like rehashing the Nazis as the villains. It was a decision made out of fear because I wanted a film that felt more like Raiders. If you don't try something new, your franchise isn't going to go anywhere. 
Well here, I am less forgiving towards Dial of Destiny. Having the Nazis as the villains for the third bloody time is a joke. It goes to show how little creativity Disney has. That they'd rather leech off previous movies instead of coming up with a new villainous faction. Before they announced who the villains were going to be, I assumed the villains would either be the Soviets again, or some other regime from the Cold War era. I mean, the Soviets would probably be rehashed villains too, but at least it would be the second time they'd be using them, not the third. But I guess villainizing the Kamis wouldn't be that well received in China, so they dialed back to the classic faction nobody except white supremacists like. That, and they didn't want anything resembling Crystal Skull. Either way, they were lazy, and the Nazis have come and gone. It's time for new villains. Well, since Disney has no creativity, we've got Indy being carried with a bag over his head. Upon being unbagged, you can see that the de-aging technology is pretty bad. Yeah, to the people who said Crystal Skull's special effects were bad, you have not seen shit yet. The de-aging of Harrison Ford is utter crap if I've ever seen it. It's obviously fake from the get-go, and I've seen a lot of independent deep fakers do better than this. Disney, with the top resources and budget, couldn't make decent special effects at least? Anyways, the Nazis discuss how he was a spy seen with a partner, and they send him off to be executed right afterwards. Now despite my complaints, the prologue is admittingly not that bad. I'd say it's alright to decent. I probably wouldn't bat an eye if they made an indie movie in the 90s and this was the opening. We get introduced to our main villain, Jurgen Vola, although he serves as a supporting antagonist in the prologue, as he has his superiors. Now something I wanted to point out is how he shares a surname with the main antagonist of the LucasArts video game, Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings. Because in that game, the main villain in Indy's rival is named Magnus Vola. James Mangold has claimed that he's a hardcore indie fan, but it's small things like this that make me heavily doubt him. If you're going to say you're a hardcore Star Wars fan, for example, I'm going to assume you know your Star Wars on an intricate level, and read at least 10 of the important books or comics or whatnot. Whenever one of these filmmakers claims they're a hardcore fan, always observe whether or not they've seen more than just the movies. In Indiana Jones as a franchise was built heavily upon the films, but the films aren't all there is to it. There's the Young Indie Chronicles, there's games like The Fate of Atlantis and Emperor's Tomb, and there's novels like Army of the Dead. I know it's highly probable James Mangold and the rest of modern Lucasfilm have no idea what Indy's mother's name is. It's Anna Mary by the way, but since you'd have to watch the Young Indie Chronicles or do some basic research to know that, I can say that no one at modern Lucasfilm is that type of fan if at all. Point is, I can guarantee until proven otherwise, that James Mangold is the type of filthy casual when it comes to Indiana Jones. He hampered to the mainstream garbage collective opinion that Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is trash after all. Is it that hard to get someone who has an intricate understanding of Indiana Jones in all media and not just the films? Because if your only experience is the films, then that's just pathetic. Now, you can be a casual fan, but 9 times out of 10, getting a casual fan who may not properly understand the source material is very risky. Especially when they have an agenda like, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is a garbage movie. Wrong, sir. Wrong. It's not even like the Staff of Kings is some obscure, hidden away book that no one's ever heard of. The Staff of Kings was like the last major Indiana Jones release from LucasArts and was available on both the popular Nintendo Wii and Sony PlayStation 2 and the Nintendo DS if you're on a road trip. You'd think that someone at least remotely familiar with the Indiana Jones franchise would know that there was already a villain with the surname Vola, especially when he's the game's main antagonist. You might be wondering why I'm venting so hard just because Mangold forgot the main villain of a game no one cares about, and it's to highlight a point that the so-called self-proclaimed hardcore fans are in actuality filthy casuals. I'm not an Indiana Jones everyman, but at least I have a decent amount of knowledge on the Indiana Jones franchise. Not the films, the franchise. I know enough about the Indiana Jones Expanded Universe to say confidently that James Mangold has no idea what Indiana Jones is on the larger scale. Speaking of, 
the Indiana Jones Expanded Universe hasn't been decanonized yet. And that's most likely because Disney has no idea the Expanded Universe of this franchise exists. Leland Chi, before the Disney acquisition, actually put up a hierarchy of canon, just like what Star Wars had. And to sum it up, the films come first, followed by the Young Indie Chronicles, followed by the actual Indie Expanded Universe, followed by the non-canon shit like the Lego games. From what I've been told as well, the Willow novels that serve as a sequel to the film Willow weren't decanonized either, right before the Disney Plus series came out. I think it's safe to say that they are unaware that such an expanded universe for both exists. And maybe with Indiana Jones, the franchise is more consistent of standalone stories, hence why they could probably keep everything canon, but again, it's a fat chance that Disney knows about the Indie Expanded Universe. This is also why the argument that Disney owns it, thus they get to do whatever they want with it, is a weak one. Until someone can send me some sort of confirmation that they've acknowledged the Indiana Jones Expanded Universe at least once, very publicly, and whether or not it's still canon according to them, I'm not budging. With that being said, let's just get on with the film. So Jürgen Voller, who has an unoriginal name, played by Mads Mikkelsen, who is completely wasted in this movie, is shown to have an obsession with the MacGuffin of the movie. Half a dial created by one Archimedes, or Archimedes, Ugh. I'll just call him Archimedes. He goes on about whoever controls the dial will become a god essentially, and do whatever they want with time travel. Although the first time I watched this movie, and this is a general problem with the movie, it zips around like a motherfucker. Being 2 hours and 30 minutes, you'd think they'd spend some time establishing the MacGuffin and mythology and all that shit, just like every other Indiana Jones movie. But nope, there are very few times the movie slows down to catch a breather, or explain why things are going on. It's just The Force Awakens all over again. It didn't set up the galaxy in play, and just zipped by at a crazy fast speed. And the only time the movie slowed down to explore the world, is the scene where Han explains Luke Skywalker's disappearance. Ironically, the movie needed more scenes like this to effectively set up the galaxy in play. Because important things like why the war is happening, where the First Order came from, what the New Republic has been doing, etc. are just ignored. But don't worry, you can find out what happened in the shitty Aftermath trilogy and the novel Bloodline. Available for only $19.99 each. Point is, they're repeating the same mistakes from the sequel trilogy. Again, this is why we do not shut up about the sequels, even though it's been a couple of years. Disney refuses to learn from their mistakes. They repeat the same shit over and 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 over again. And it's getting old. Anyways, we've also got another antique, the Spear of Destiny, which later turns out to be fake once we get on the train. I don't know what the point of having this artifact was given it has no plot relevance. I think we should have focused on the dial instead. Anyways, we get introduced to Indy's companion Basil Shaw. Basil doesn't really do much in this film beyond the prologue. He's captured by the Nazis just like Jones and is sent to a train all tied up. We see meanwhile that Indiana Jones is about to be hung by the rope and conveniently an allied bomb drops from the ceiling although it doesn't detonate right away, and Indiana Jones uses the opportunity to escape. Now, part of Indy's identity as a series is surviving near impossible odds, so I'm not going to complain about this. And it was established that the Allies are closing in on the Nazis from both sides, so I don't really have anything to complain about. I did say, after all, that the start wasn't actually terrible. I'd say this actually feels like something from an Indiana Jones movie, but believe me, it completely stops feeling like an Indiana Jones movie after a bit. So after Indy escapes the rope, he sneaks through the Nazis and pretends to be some driver for the Nazis, where he's actually going to rescue his friend Basil. Again, I don't have any complaints, as it's something Indiana Jones would do. He always goes to rescue his friends. We've got a nice sequence of him jumping onto a bike and boarding the train. Now something I have to complain about that applies to this whole movie is the soundtrack. It's got that Rise of Skywalker problem of being a greatest hits compilation instead of being a new score. My theory is that Kathleen Kennedy, 
James Mangold, or whoever, rejected John Williams' original score and told them to dial back to what would be nostalgic. The same happened with The Force Awakens. And again, lessons were not learned. If there was ever a key message through this film's failures, it's that you should learn from your mistakes and not do the same thing over and over again. So Indiana Jones mostly hikes across the train, evading Nazis, and I'd say it's pretty well done. The way they pace out Nazis catching on to Indy after he steals something, and chasing him across trams and whatnot. And there's even a part where Indy blends in to remain undetected. That was such an Assassin's Creed moment, but it doesn't manage to feel too video gamey. Anyways, Indy frees Basil. And they both evade an allied attack, and it's here where the main guy in the prologue, Colonel Weebar, or Weber, I don't know how it's pronounced, catches up to Indy and they have their fight. Basil during this fight is a bit clumsy, but it's done in a way where Henry Jones Sr. was clumsy, so I can't complain about this too much. Basil is clearly shown to be not much of a fighter, but anyways, after Indy Spartan kicks the Colonel off, Vola shows up and then demands they give him back the dial, although a pole or something eventually catches the train, and he is smacked in the face with it and falls off. I'm not a physician, but that probably would have killed him, or at the very least, gave him severe brain damage. Indy and Basil jump off the train just as the Royal Air Force bomb the train, and that's the end of the prologue, and the first 20 minutes of the movie. Now, despite my complaints, I have to say that the prologue was actually a competent start. It could have a bit of touch applied to it to make it a great start. For example, establishing the MacGuffin more and whatnot, but for what it's worth, it's well paced and well done. Despite the mistake of not putting a time up on screen, I can tell it's a time where the Nazis are about to lose and be caught with their pants down. However, the film begins to go downhill, and by the time they introduced a certain character, I felt like I was about to go crazy. Anyways, we cut to around 25 years later in 1969. Although again, they don't put a time on screen, where Indy wakes up from the couch, and they present him as this old man who is out of touch with the modern day. That I really hate. In Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Indy might have been old, but he still held his own without falling on his ass and becoming a complete embarrassment. Harrison Ford had a strict diet of fish to get in shape for the role, given he was in his 60s at that point. Here, he is nearly 80 years old. In the Indiana Jones canon, he's around 60 years old. In Crystal Skull, he may have been older, but they didn't make him weaker because of that. We still had those themes of being older and whatnot, but they showed us a strong man who resisted the curse of age. So here, by having him show his age in all instances, I really did not like that. This film from what I've seen was heavily built upon Indy being old, and I really wish they did not undo Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Dial of Destiny also fails to have a sense of finality. What I mean by that is that this feels like this is in the middle of the series, rather than being the last one. The stakes are pretty generic feeling, especially at the end, where the climax is, and that was probably the worst place to have low stakes. I really hate the state they put Indy in, where they show that he's going through a divorce, or a separation, whatever, with Marion. The moment they showed that paper on screen, I was furious. Why the hell would they backtrack on Crystal Skull's excellent ending? Okay, I know why, and it only gets worse later, but still. This film already is setting up the audience for a negative reaction. I also despise the part where Indy has a picture of young Marion on his fridge, and he just decides to stamp it off. He basically goes out to teach, and we see that there's a huge buzz around the Apollo 11 moon mission. Unfortunately, the backdrop of the space race is really lacking. If you've seen my Crystal Skull review, I noted how well they convincingly showed us the 1950s Cold War setting. In this movie, they don't use the space race for anything other than the setting. Seriously, the setting doesn't tie into the story at all. This is in complete contrast with how the movie itself started, as the near destruction of World War II was presented quite well. 
and I felt like we were in the setting, and how the story in relation to the setting was ultra relevant. Since the main conflict is about the guy wanting to change history through time travel, it probably would have made for a better movie if the 1960s as a setting was cut out entirely. Have the movie set in 1944 or 1945 with the Nazis on the brink of defeat, and Vola, or whoever, intends to go back in time and undo every Allied victory with the power of hindsight. And Indiana Jones intercepts him to 1939, or 1933, or whatever date Vola chooses. And Indian friends intercept him, and stop him from changing the past. Sounds a lot like the Terminator, but you know that Disney isn't above plagiarism. This would have made the Nazis more intertwined as the antagonist, and it would have fit with the setting. Seriously, what was the point of setting the main movie in the 1960s, if you're not going to have a 1960s story? They really wrote themselves into a corner with not wanting to make another Cold War movie because the mainstream garbage normies hated Crystal Skull. But they wrote in the safest antagonist imaginable without having it tie into the setting. If you're going to have a movie with a 1960s backdrop, actually provide 1960s aesthetics. Like, things I think of when I come to the 60s are stuff like the Cold War at its peak, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the Space Race, and the media that spawned from that like Star Trek, and the Civil Rights Movement, and so on and so forth. The 60s was a crazy time for the world, and there's a lot of interesting stories you could tell. Like imagine Indiana Jones in the Race to the Moon, or fuck it, let's go with Indiana Jones and the Government Conspiracy. Or hell, let's go with Indiana Jones and the Horrors of Vietnam. Or wait, I've got one that can top all that. It's called Indiana Jones and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Wouldn't that be a treat? Great drama, high stakes, and so on. My only guess is that those premises would be way too interesting. So they went to the boring Nazis again, in a setting that doesn't even work with them in it. Nazis in the 60s are old news. They were defeated and discredited forever. End of story. Silly mustache man done goofed. So at the end of the day, to Kathleen Kennedy, James Mangold, and whoever else, I have this to say. I think you took an incredible advantage and squandered it. Okay, let's just get on with the film. We've got Indy teaching in a classroom that doesn't resemble the classroom he normally teaches in. Gee, you know your movie is bad when you can't even book filming locations. Either that, or they couldn't replicate the set. Whichever it is, I'm disappointed. This is a contributing reason why this doesn't feel like an Indiana Jones movie. The locations are really off. The greatest sin is probably not having Spielberg back to direct the set, because that's probably the only way this could feel consistent. At least the students in Indy's classroom feel like 1960s blokes, I guess. Indy's basically teaching a history lesson or something, and this is where the dreaded Helena Shaw comes into play. She sits in Indy's classroom, and is presented to us being knowledgeable about history and the like. I will say that in her first scene, I didn't hate her. At least not yet. This scene establishes that she knows as much about the shtick as Indiana Jones, which ideally is nice for having the sort of character that can work well with them, and could actually make a likeable character. But knowing Kathleen Kennedy, Helena is soon subverted into the worst character in the series, and oh boy, we'll get to that. Oh yeah, get ready. So a theme of this film is Indiana Jones being a forgotten and overshadowed hero, and someone comes into Indy's classroom towards the end of the class, showing the Apollo 11 moon mission astronauts, with Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. I suppose this scene is meant to show that Indy's got that underdog trope of having people no longer revere him as a hero. I'd say that, but then in the very next scene, Indy has a surprise party in his honor, where the Dean thanks him for his service to Hunter College, and that's where it clicks. Indy doesn't teach at Marshall College anymore, which is such a baffling decision. And it's another example of them undoing Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. At the end of that movie, Indy had restored his reputation with the government, and the university he worked at. When I saw the dean of the new university Indy worked at, someone who obviously isn't played by Jim Broadbent, 
I was like, who the heck are you? Then I realized that despite Indy's happy ending, including him being associate dean at Marshall College, they decided to throw that away and instead have him transferred to another university at least one or two years after Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I did the math based on the dialogue in this movie. This really is insulting to piss all over Crystal Skull's ending, where Indy gets married, gets his job back on top of a promotion, has a son who can continue his lineage, and so on. Like seriously, that's why Crystal Skull topped Last Crusade as the definitive ending. It might not be as dramatic as riding off into the sunset to end a trilogy, but in the context of the whole thing, Crystal Skull was great. Dial of Destiny's conflict ideally would be for Indy to fight for those he had, like his wife and son. Imagine in a hypothetical Indiana Jones and the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest the world has come to total destruction, Indy in those 13 days remembers why he's doing his damnedest to prevent nuclear war. When you're making a sequel, you're supposed to build upon what came before, not tear it all down. I truly am pissed for how little regard they have for Indiana Jones. This might not be quite a situation where he's now Jake Jones, but maybe a push or two more down the stairs would probably do it. It also bothered me that Indy doesn't continue adopting his given name of Henry. In Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, he became more accepting of the name his father gave him. And it showed that despite his father's passing, his memory of him continues by adopting his name as Henry Jones Jr. And this extended to his son Mutt, also embracing his given name as Henry Jones III. Well done, Henry! Hey, socks. This isn't even something you can really put on the big bad kingdom of the Crystal Skull, as this was all set up in the Last Crusade. Speaking of which, I was shocked that for a movie that heavily relies on flaunting nostalgia, they had minimal references to Henry Jones Sr. or Marcus Brody. You'd think they'd put those two on pedestals, especially with the relative recent passing of Sean Connery. Crystal Skull had a very meaningful tribute to both characters. Even though Sean Connery in particular was still alive at the time. Somewhere your grandpa is laughing. <laughs> The only notable reference to Henry Jones Sr. I can remember is Indy referencing how he's inherited his father's watch or whatever. It felt like for a movie reliant on nostalgia, they were asked backwards with how they did it. I mean, this is where it's all comparable to The Force Awakens again. Despite baiting fans with the return of the OG characters, they barely did anything with them. You'd think that Luke would have had more of a presence in the next movie, beyond him just being a ploy to sell the next movie. Spider-Man No Way Home may have been a lazily written movie, but they knew what fans would like, and how to maximize enjoyability. Despite not being in majority of the movie, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield were given the respect they deserved through their presence. And they surprisingly didn't just make everything all about Tobey Maguire. As Garfield gets some characterization with hints at what happened to him after The Amazing Spider-Man 2. If only Lucasfilm would show the prequels the same amount of respect, the same way Marvel showed the overshadowed and not so popular webverse. As flawed as it is, Spider-Man No Way Home celebrated previous Spider-Man films, no matter their quality or reception. But modern Lucasfilm has this mentality of celebrating the stuff that only everyone likes, with a safe original trilogy, and keep in mind that Lucasfilm and Marvel are both owned by Disney. And Kevin Feige ironically knows how to respect legacy characters better than Kathleen, despite them both being soulless corporate hacks. I've vented for quite a while, so let's just get on with the movie. So Indy gets a gift for his retirement, which I mean, it would be so much more effective if this was the university he taught at for several decades straight. He walks out of the university, giving his retirement gift to some random stranger. Being followed by Helena, Indy goes to a bar to drink in peace, and this is where Helena fully enters the plot. Apparently she and Indy have a history together because of her father Basil. Before we see them in conversation, we cut to a black guy giving room service to Vola and his goons. I half expected Vola to make racist remarks towards the guy giving him room service. Instead, it's an exchange about the room service guy serving in the army in World War II. 
and Vola asks him if he's enjoyed his victory. Now, Vola, I must say, is a very weak villain. He doesn't display any charisma, nor is he overly brutal or cruel, and he pretty much lacks all the traits that make Indiana Jones villains effective. Vola has a bunch of Americans as his goons. The supporting villains are just as weak as the main villain. They don't really do anything heinous or brutal enough, except for maybe one instance we'll get to. I find it laughable that Vola convinced a bunch of Americans that they could go back in time and have the Nazis win World War II. Now, I can totally accept that these guys are outcasts who probably joined the KKK at one point and hold very Nazi-ish beliefs. Otherwise, why would they be following this guy? But since Vola no longer possesses the time travel device or whatever, how did he get these guys to follow him? Wouldn't it make more sense to have Vola's top henchmen be people who researched with him and knew about the dial? And maybe the Americans are just goons who are neo-Nazis and former clansmen? But an even bigger problem with this movie is why Vola waited this long to try and retrieve the dial from either Indy or Basil. The former is a famous archaeologist after all, and would be easy to track down. Unless he was in a coma for the longest time, which is unlikely based on what Vola's been doing. He has changed his name to Schmidt and has been someone who helped NASA with its space program. But he's still bitter over losing the war. This intro didn't make me give a shit about the villains in any sense. So moving on, Indy and Helena talk about when she was growing up. It's revealed here that Basil is deceased. And they talk about the dial. Helena tries to encourage Indy to discover the power of the dial as a final triumph. And that it would benefit both of them. Okay? So far, Helena's not expressing any unlikable traits. But I fucking knew that eventually, she'd do something to become the worst character character ever. And these scenes so far, I'm guessing was meant to give you a false sense of security. But since I remembered that this character is played by the same bitch as L337, I was ready for anything. Turns out Indy stored the dial in a college storeroom. Yeah, why the hell would Indy put the dial in a storage room where anyone could steal it? Wouldn't something like that belong in a museum? This plot doesn't make any sense. Especially when Vola's henchmen show up. Something really confusing about this movie is where a CIA agent assists Vola's henchmen. Apparently the agency wants Indy for some reason. Rewatching the movie, there isn't really an explanation given. And this whole thing becomes incredibly messy. I was scratching my head in confusion asking, wait, what's going on? Well, I had a look on the Indiana Jones wiki and apparently this was about Helena, not Jones. Yeah, that's right. So Indy and Helena get the dial out of the storage room, but Vola's henchmen show up to take the dial, and I wasn't surprised that this happened, but I was furious regardless, when Helena locks the escape route on Indy and flees with the dial. God fucking damn it! You bitch! Yeah, that is the moment I made my mind up about Helena, and believe me, past this point, things don't get any better. She's a pretentious, Woke as shit, bratty little bitch. And while the first two scenes she was in wasn't actually bad, she of course subverts into someone that everyone will fucking hate. Helena has no excuse to hijack the story like this. It's called Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is about the titular character, a straight white man. And all stories are centered on him as the protagonist. I guess he is still the main character, although he's dragged down heavily by Helena's antics. A politically correct tag-along character in a series that is anything but politically correct. I mean, going woke would destroy the very identity of the series. We wouldn't get fan favorites like Short Round otherwise, who, if you think about it, indulges the Chinese boy stereotype. Yeah, so that's another criticism. Going woke goes against the series. Indiana Jones is not for snowflakes. That's another reason why this doesn't feel like an Indiana Jones movie. Because it's politically correct in a series that is never politically correct. This should be obvious, but a lot of people don't seem to realize this. Indiana Jones has themes of vengeance against the Nazis for Christ's sake. Anyways, back to the film, Indy has to improvise after being left for dead, and escapes the other way, although he doesn't take the opportunity to escape very well. Instead, he stops to check on the dead bodies, and does the incredibly risky move of calling the police on a telephone. 
Now, in a horror movie, calling the police would be the best bet, but for Indiana Jones, this seems incredibly out of place and out of character. Indiana Jones calling the police and pleading with a helpless voice is baffling. Like, come on, you could have had him bust open a window and use his whip to escape. That would have been more believable, and probably would have helped the flow of the chase sequence, because instead, the bad guys hold him at gunpoint and throw him into a van during the Apollo 11 parade. The agent asks Indy about Helena, and Indy responds that Helena's his goddaughter. I had no idea what a goddaughter is supposed to be, so I looked it up. And apparently, to have someone be your godchild, you have to be present in a baptism ceremony or something after they're born. Uh, okay? To be honest, I'm pretty sure they attach the title of goddaughter to Helena to give her a superficial sense of importance in relation to Indy. And that's pretty lazy. The way Indy says that Helena is his goddaughter kind of tells me that this movie is pretending she's this super important character. I don't understand why if they needed a female lead in this movie, why they didn't just go with Marion Ravenwood. It would have made the most sense, but I guess Marion was too much of an organically strong female character. And Kathleen Kennedy was looking for something more artificial. The pretentious writing definitely comes off in the movie. Well anyways, the van can't go anywhere because the road is closed off for the parade. And that's where they drag Indy out of the car. And Vola's goons will hope that nobody will notice that he's being kidnapped. This is incredibly hard to believe for obvious reasons. If he was being restrained, people would obviously notice. And Indy does take the opportunity to escape into the crowd. This is where Vola's right hand fires a gun at Indy, who proceeds to run around the corner. Despite there being shots fired, Indy tries walking up to an oblivious police officer, who would have clearly heard the gunshots, but I'm guessing the writers forgot how loud gunshots are. Indy tries to explain himself to the officer, but he just trips over his words, and it's embarrassing to watch. Especially because, again, it's out of place and out of character. I don't know why he stopped to talk to a police officer, and why he didn't just keep on running. Because someone else probably would have spoken to the police officer anyways. I just knew how this situation was set up the way it was. Indy stopping in his tracks is just so the bad guys can catch up to him. In which the right hand whacks the police officer out cold. Well, at least it felt like a hard punch in the sound effects department and Indy gets away on horse, and uses it as his getaway transport. I suppose they wanted a call back to the times Indy used a horse, so he uses the horse to get away, and he takes it into a subway station, and we get that shot from the trailer where he narrowly avoids ramming into a subway train, and he gets away sliding through the tram doors. I don't have a lot to say about this chase sequence. I probably would have liked it more if the context behind it wasn't so god-awful. The scene that I'd say is closest in comparison is the chase from Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, where Indy and Mutt escape from Russian agents. But the difference is, that scene had momentum. And to be frank, that was probably the weakest chase sequence in the movie. Compared to the other ones, the chase was small in scale, so it had an obvious disadvantage. So anyways, Voller is informed that both Helena and Indy got away, and he shows no meaningful reaction. He comes across as bored more than anything. He must really not care about changing history. So anyways, Indy gets the assistance of Sulla, who makes his return to the franchise, although he does jack shit. He's informed by him once he manages to make it indoors that Helena is a fucking criminal for auctioning illegal stuff. So if anything, this tells us, the audience, that Helena is an incredibly shallow person. The way Sulla says it too, basically says she's a nuisance and a troublemaker. And oh boy, did her previous scenes, on top of ones yet to come and force that. This is pretty much where Helena has no hope of being likeable. Sulla explains that after she was arrested, she was bailed out by a Moroccan mob boss. And this is important information to keep in mind for later. That's where Sulla informs Indy that there's going to be an auction of stolen antiques. Yeah, so Helena's going to sell it. Has Kathleen Kennedy ever seen another Indiana Jones movie? This is an honest question, because she seemed to forget that in Raiders of the Lost Ark, the rivalry between Indy 
and Belloc had them contrast with each other. They have the same profession, but where they differ is in their methods. Indy respects archaeology and almost always gives the stuff he finds to a museum. Belloc, on the other hand, is more concerned with stuffing his pockets with cash that he'd rather sell as prizes which he commonly takes off Indy to sell to the highest bidder rather than a respected institution like a museum. Does this sound familiar? In Raiders we were not supposed to like Belloc. While not cruel, he was greedy, egotistical, and arrogant. He had negative traits that few would respect. So why the hell are they giving very negative traits to Helena if the movie expects us to like her? Having Helena try to sell the dial to the highest bidder is by the standards set up in the series, very despicable. I feel insulted being expected to like this character. Pretty much the only difference between Belloc and Helena is that Belloc was very clearly the main villain. While Helena is a tag along character, you're supposed to see as a hero even though she's anything but. So moving on, although Indy is pursued by the authorities because of what happened at the parade, Indy and Sulla drive him to the airport, which is stupid because the airport always keeps track of who's going through. Maybe it was less strict before 9-11, but still. I have to ask why they didn't just arrange for Indy to smuggle himself out of the country. It would have served the same purpose, except it would have made sense. The airport is the last place you want to go, aside from a police station. Of course, since things always have to be made piss easy for the plot to progress, Indy takes a plane and isn't recognized as a fugitive. Well anyways, Sulla when he's dropping Indy off, gives Indy a goodbye speech for his journey, and it's not actually half bad, although it's ruined by a car that stops in front of Indy with the loud sound of the brakes. Anyways, Indy's on the plane going over the papers, in which we get a flashback. And just like the flashback in The Last Jedi, it's incredibly out of place in an Indiana Jones film. The closest thing to a flashback I can remember in the Indy film was The Last Crusade prologue. But that wasn't really a flashback, because that's how the movie started. And they weren't flashing back from blackness before the film started. Point is, Indiana Jones movies tell their story in the present. So having an out of place flashback tells me they got stuck with the story and didn't know how to convey it without a flashback. So yeah, that's an additional reason why this movie feels nothing like Indiana Jones. But let's just get to the flashback. The flashback concerns Basil and Indy, where we see that Basil is tempted to destroy the dial, but Indy stops him and convinces him to hand the dial over. That's where Basil gets Indy to promise if he hands it over, Indy will destroy it. Well, as we've seen, Indy didn't keep his promise. Now, I'd imagine Indy would have either hid it somewhere or gave it to a museum if he didn't destroy it. It was dumb as fuck that he put it in the university storage room, but hey, at least he wasn't consumed by greed and tried to stoop down to Belloc's level, unlike a certain someone. Something I also found out of place is how they didn't include a travel path from the United States to Morocco. Sure, they include one later, but why not here? Maybe it doesn't matter as much, but keep in mind I've been criticizing this movie for lacking a lot of little touches that makes Indiana Jones movies what they are. But anyways, both Indy and Helena on separate planes make it to Morocco. So at the club or whatever it's supposed to be, Indy comes in to see the auction and play. We get a brief interaction with this kid who is essentially Helena's short round, except nowhere near as charismatic or likeable. In other words... It's dry, overcooked on the outside, raw on the inside. Yeah. Back in line. Thank you. Anyways, Indy goes into the auction, and Helena of course expresses no regret for leaving Indy for dead, and even makes a snarky remark that the hat makes him look at least two years younger, and it's said in the most pretentious way. She continues going on, dismissing Indy, and even smugly talks about how she paid off the police, and Indy's the one wanted for murder. Anyways, the bad guy shows up, and Vola has a standoff with Indy at the other side of the table. Indy recognizes Vola as the Nearzy who was after the dial, and it soon becomes every man for himself, in which chaos ensues. 
Although Indy grabs the dial and gets that other scene from the trailer where the guns are pulled on Indy, and he ducks down. Helena Shitstain grabs the dial, followed by Vola grabbing it off the Shitstain. And when Indy and Helena make it outside, Vola is nowhere in sight. But Moroccan police show up, and we get another snarky remark from Helena telling Indy that she told the cops to shoot him. Another reason to hate this bitch. The cops back down when the Moroccan Mafia shows up, and this is where the mention of Helena being bailed out comes full circle. Yeah, turns out Helena's bailout required he marry the son of the big boss. Helena's pretentious nature still persists. This is also around the part I got sick of watching this movie in the theater. It's not a very entertaining watch after all. To get through the chase scene in the smoothest way possible, I'd first like to say that Helena belittles Indy, and Indy continues showing his age. Helena Shitstein also tags along, and let me tell you that he does very little. Basically, it's a three-way chase, one for the dial, and the other to get away from Helena's fiancé. And at that point, I'm shocked at why Indy didn't try to throw Helena off. After all, she showed no care when she left him for dead. The chase scene to sum it up is underwhelming. Helena's snarky quips did nothing but piss me off, and made it impossible to invest in what's happening. Because the only thing I care about in this movie, pretty much, is Indy. Everyone else can eat a fucking dick until they can prove their worth to care about or to hate as the villains. And as I said, Helena's a bitch. Shit stains useless, and the villains are one-dimensional. And although Indy's presented as out of character in a bunch of instances, I still cared about him. It's like having a gold character in a stinking brown movie, where he stands out as the best part, but no one else is worth a shit. Even the legacy character Sulla didn't do it for me, but hey, at least I don't have ill to speak of them. Anyways, after the chase sequence, which was just dull, the three who are basically on this adventure from this point forward need to go to a site with instructions to the second part of the dial. So they go to Greece where Indy meets one of his friends, Ronaldo, who right off the bat, would have made a better supporting ally than bitch Helena. I should also mention how the American agent is killed by Vola's goons, and there's an end to that pointless character. But anyways, just like Sulla, Ronaldo is supportive and likable. There's just one problem. He isn't in this movie a lot. So I wanted to talk about something really important in relation to this movie. And it's where there's this conversation between Helena and Indy, surprisingly. It's one of the few times the movie actually slows down to give the characters room to breathe. Shocking, right? With that being said, it's here where Indy, when asked about what he would do if he could go back in time, gives an answer I really hate. He reveals that Mutt Williams, his son, died in Vietnam before this movie starts. You can just tell this was done to spite Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and the George Lucas haters must have cheered in the theater, but for the rest of us, killing Mutt off screen was incredibly insulting, especially with what they're doing in this movie. This is perhaps one of the biggest insults to Crystal Skull, that Indy's son gets killed off. Let me guess, you were probably thinking, oh boy, we can't bring Mutt back because everybody hates Shia LaBeouf. Yes, you can! So yeah, this is the reason why Indy's marriage with Marion is down the shitter. It's because Mutt died, undoing Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and its happy ending. Indy further explains that Marion's grief is never ending. This scene is deliberately put in to spite Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but the scene on its own is supposed to be played for sympathy and whatnot. Sorry, Disney, but you don't get to destroy the cake and then eat it too. Before I saw this movie, I got a comment warning me of this film's only reference to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Mutt's death is pretty much the reason why this film starts off with Indy having a shitty life. So yeah, I've said my case on how they shit on Crystal Skull. That Disney once again listens to the mainstream garbage critics rather than invested Indiana Jones fans. So basically what happens is that Ronaldo takes Indy to the Mediterranean Sea or whatever, or the Aegean Sea or however the hell it's pronounced. Indy, Helena and Ronaldo go underwater to retrieve the thingamajig. There is a small moment where Indy is trapped by some eels, which I guess is the snake stand in, and eventually the Nazis show up and hold everyone hostage. When Vola pressures Indy to decode the tablet he found, he refuses, and I called this moment from a mile away, 
But of course, Fowler decides to straight up execute Ronaldo. Well, that's one way to waste Antonio Banderas' talent, and also an unfortunate end to a character with potential. I knew that Ronaldo was going to be the one targeted, not the bitch Helena or her shit stain. Helena then pretends to help the bad guys while trying to get Indy to spark some dynamite. This is the film's excuse for the three of them left to escape. And they got the tablet with them. They speed the fuck away, and I realize they need to go to Sicily. And for some reason, Vola is able to track them. When I first saw the movie, I thought it was contrived that he could observe which direction they were going, and conclude exactly where they were going. But I'm bloody sick of this movie, and I'd rather wrap things up sooner than later. Also, I'd like to mention the moment they went outside the United States, I couldn't tell we were still in the 1960s. So that adds to my point about the setting not being utilized. Indiana Jones and the Cuban Missile Crisis would have been a treat, wouldn't it? Anyways, in Sicily, the shit stain wanders off after deciding to buy some ice cream, or, I'm sorry, gelato, and gets captured by the bad guys. When they realize he's missing or whatever, they continue to the site to go find the tomb of Archimedes. Along the way, Shitstein, who's cuffed to the big brute guy, trips them both over onto the bridge, and he manages to escape by stealing the key and uncuffing himself, while presumably leaving the big brute guy to drown. Yeah, so another trope they completely failed to do was having that big fight with a big brute. I know that Last Crusade didn't have one, but that was only because it was cut. They fully intended to have Pat Roach do a fight before plans changed. I was somewhat waiting for a fight with the big brute guy, where Indy struggles to beat him, but eventually comes up on top and the big brute dies in some horrible way. But in this movie, they don't do that. Instead, they have the kid take out the brute. And we don't even see the brute drown. They just imply that he probably did. When I saw the brute, I was curious on what the fist fight with Indy would be like, as well as the brutal death. But nope, never happens. Anyways, let's just get on with the climax. Indy and Bitch Helena find the tomb of Archimedes, where they discover weird things in his resting place, like propellers on the phoenix on his coffin, and the fact that he's got a watch on his wrist. Something that won't be invented for another thousand years. The movie is trying to set up intrigue, but I honestly just didn't care. I think something that should have been set up and emphasized is how much Indy reveres Archimedes, which would pay off just before the movie ends. But oh boy, we'll get to that. So anyways, the bad guys show up and take the half of the dial that they need, in which Vola connects the mechanism, and the time travel device is now functional. We get a brief scuffle, which to summarize, ends up with Bitch Helena and Shitstain getting away. While Indy is shot, although in a non-lethal area, although being shot of course weakens him, and he's captured by the bad guys, who decide not to kill him, despite not needing him for anything. In the previous films, whenever the bad guys keep Indy alive is when they need him for something. As an example, Walter Donovan kept Indy alive and forced him to go get him the grail by shooting his father where he would eventually bleed out if Indy didn't hurry up. But here, there's no reason to keep Indy alive. He's wounded, and Vola has an opportunity only seen very rarely. The opportunity to kill Indiana Jones. Who even in the movie canon alone, has survived near impossible odds. But nah, Vola decides to take Indy with him. In the context of the movie, it makes no sense. It's the whole, I could kill you, but I want you to see me destroy everything you love cliche that happens in stories, and it's a lazy way of keeping the hero alive almost all of the time, and it certainly is here. Worse still, since Vola plans to bring Indy with him, he reveals his crazy plan. Indy directly asks Vola what he plans to do when he goes back in time, and Vola reveals that his target isn't even someone like Winston Churchill, or even Indiana Jones. No, he plans to kill Silly Mustache Man himself. He explains that he has memorized every single mistake made by Silly Mustache Man. So he plans to kill the dude and become the architect for a Nazi victory. Now me and my brothers walking out of the theater were talking about how that last part was open to a numerous set of factors. Let's say that Vola was able to assassinate Silly Mustache Man. How does Vola think he's going to influence major decisions? He's obviously not going to rise as leader, since he's appearing in the past 
just before the war starts. In any time travel movie, anyone going into the past has to essentially build their own life from scratch with other people. In the Terminator, for example, nobody knew who Carl Reese was when he travelled back in time to 1984. And it would be laughable to say that he could hypothetically get a job that requires a license if he survived his mission. The answer why is simple. He literally has no American citizenship or credentials in the slightest. I suppose Vola could convince his past self or something to get him a position in the government. Assuming Vola was affiliated with the Nazis prior to the point of his future self traveling back. But it's a fat chance that he would automatically become Fuhrer. Or even come into the meeting room with whoever silly mustache man's successor is. Realistically... I'd say maybe Heinrich Himmler. Also, if Fowler is identified as the one who killed Silly Mustache Man, he'd be locked up by German police and certainly won't be making any big decisions. Like, wouldn't a better time to go back to his 1932 or 1933, the year where the Third Reich was rising, and where you could secure a high-ranking position in the regime? There are mistakes Silly Mustache Man made before the war even started. For example... And from what I've researched, he underestimated the importance of naval warfare and should have made more U-boats in preparation for the war. And it was a serious disadvantage he faced when the war started. Yeah, so I don't understand why he'd go back on the brink of war. There's obviously a lot of important stuff that happened in the years leading up to the war that would need to change too. Ensuring that the Third Reich was perfect and undefeatable years before the war starts would make a better plan. For someone who says that he memorized every mistake, he sure did forget a lot of important ones. Because preparation before a war is also very important. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail, is how the saying goes. Now with all those downsides in Vola's questionable plan, the one thing I liked is that we're finally seeing his ruthless fanaticism. That he's more loyal to the violent ideology than even the person who created it. He plans to kill its creator just to preserve the ideology in the long term. Gee, I wish this was shown way earlier in the movie because we're almost done now. So Vola and his goods go to a nearby airfield, which let's just say he rented for this occasion or something. I thought that until the dude guarding the airfield was shot by one of the goons, meaning that they're basically just taking this airfield by force. It just seems way too convenient. Everyone in this group all dress up in full Nazi uniform and Bitch Helena and Shitstain show up. With Bitch Helena running after the takeoff plane in a motorcycle while Shitstain gets on a plane and manages to fly it. What the hell? Does Shitstain know how to fly a plane? We even see him get nervous before flying the plane successfully and doing so in hot pursuit of the bad guy's plane. The difference with someone like Short Round is that he was clearly shown as proficient with driving. Then you realize the reason there's a second plane to begin with is so the good guys have a way to get back after the bad guys' plane crashes. Wow. Thanks for giving away part of the movie's climax. Indy, who hasn't been executed yet, yells out at Vola that his calculations are wrong. Because he forgot about Archimedes' ignorance on continental drift or something. So Vola's dial calculations are wrong. And the plane proceeds to fly into the time wormhole or something. And when they all travel back, they've arrived not in 1939, but rather in 214 BC. During the siege of Syracuse. Gee, these writers really were on drugs, weren't they? Indy observes Roman ships and realizes that they're in the wrong time period. Well, at least we're not just getting the World War II setting again. And I was hoping that if Indiana Jones had time travel, they'd actually travel back to ancient history. I said this before the movie came out, and well, at least we get to see ancient history instead of the shit we've already seen before. In a better movie, this probably would have made things more interesting. But seeing so little of the ancient history play out is disappointing. Still though, I am at least glad they didn't travel back to World War II. Anyways, Indy and Bitch Helena struggle with Vola as the plane gets damaged by Roman weaponry and is on the verge of crashing. And Vola gets shot as the pair use a parachute to glide safely down onto the island. Archimedes, who appears during all this, discovers the plane crash with Vola and takes the watch off of his corpse, explaining how he got it in his tomb. 
Let me just say firsthand that the Terminator already did all this shit and did it better. Indy observes history playing out between his eyes and wishes to stay in the past. When I heard that, I was sweating bullets. We all know that Indy has to be around until at least the 1990s because of young Indy Chronicles. Archimendes and some Greek soldiers show up and Indy and Bitch Helena communicate to him in ancient Greek. Bitch Helena though totally ruins the scene through her intrusive remarks. Indy decides he wants to stay in the past and live out the rest of his life in the past and he makes up his mind and you want to know what Bitch Helena does? She literally just ignores Indy's decision and knocks him out. Jesus Christ. As if I couldn't already hate Bitch Helena enough. She just ruins this whole adventure. And meeting with a historical figure by abruptly punching Indy. Thinking back to Last Crusade and the Grail Knight, he was a figure from the distant past given a proper send-off. But Archimendes doesn't get that because Bitch Helena goes against Indy's decision. I mean, let's be real. These writers have shown that they have no idea about the young Indy Chronicles. So this writing decision was just meant to insult the audience and Indy as a character. Besides, Indy's wanted by the police in the present, but it seems that in the very next scene, the writers forgot about that. So yeah, we get an ending that isn't earned. Indy shows incredible disappointment that his decision was rejected by Bitch Helena. And on top of that, she receives no punishment for it. Which at that point, it would be so satisfying if Indy literally smacked her in the face and beat her to death. And in his own home. But I suppose that wouldn't be politically correct enough for Disney. Also, Bitch Helena makes the weak argument that she didn't let Indy stay because he would have changed the course of history. I hate how she says this with the utmost confidence. Like, how does she know that Indy wasn't supposed to stay in the past for the whole predestination paradox to be fulfilled? So really, Bitch Helena was just deciding what happens next against Indy's wishes. Indy even responds as if that's supposed to be a bad thing. And damn, what a good point. Indy could have introduced modern ways of thinking and practices that wouldn't be discovered for thousands of years and advanced civilization tenfold. He could have prevented all the terrible events that happened in the far future. He could have taught things like racial and gender equality in a time where that was sorely lacking. For a movie made by such a quote-unquote progressive company, they really didn't think this out. Yeah, so by the movie's own logic, Indy was in the right, and all Bitch Helena responds with is how Indy belongs in the present. And as it turns out, Bitch Helena somehow got Marion Ravenwood to show up. Marion tells Indy that she was told on the adventure Indy went on, and apparently this convinced her to not separate with him. Uh, what? Wasn't it established that Indy and Marion's relationship fell apart because Mutt died? Nothing has been resolved in relation to that. So this happy ending that's going on right now is not believable. Also again, I thought Indy was wanted by the police. Or did Bitch Helena just pay off the cops like she said earlier in the movie that she did for herself? So there's literally no consequences at all. But to try and ham in this forced ending, they've also got Sulla along with his grandchildren. I was just scoffing at the sheer audacity this movie was doing to try and sell this ending. To show Sulla and Marion at the same fucking time to bait the audience, this is disgraceful. And then Indy and Marion are left alone, and they reference that scene where Marion kisses Indy in different places, like in Raiders, and I fail to see how this reference fits in the context of the movie. And that's Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And the final shot is a circle to black where they show Indy's hat, which is also out of place for an Indiana Jones film. At least Young Indy Chronicles wasn't outright contradicted. So that's Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. This film was fucking awful, and Helena was by far the worst part of it, being a bratty little bitch who hijacks the film. Seriously, cutting her out of this film probably would have made things 10 times better. The Nazi still wouldn't fit in the 1960s setting, along with the plot holes and contrivances and whatnot, but at least this film could be enjoyable on the first watch. The cracks and holes would have popped up eventually to those who thought about the film's story and the lazy writing, but the film could easily distract from it. 
As I said, the start to the film was actually kind of decent and is the closest this piece of shit ever comes to feeling like an Indiana Jones film. I've noted the previous ways this film forgets certain tropes and tricks previous films used that takes me out of the movie. But with that being said, this film was severely dragged down by a lot of factors. Undoing Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was an arrogant, lethal mistake and proves they failed to learn from The Force Awakens onwards. Dial of Destiny was terrible, end of story. And unfortunately, I'm still seeing people having the gall to defend it. Seriously. Well, I've said my piece on Indiana Jones and the Diarrhea of Destiny. I don't want to spend any more time talking about it. So I'll just give the film a 2 out of 10 and be done with it. The reason it's a 2 is because there's a minuscule amount of stuff that I may be kinda like. Now I think it's time to look to the future, just like Star Wars. I also want to be an Indiana Jones everyman. So after I'm done with young indie chronicles down the line, I think it'll be time to indulge in the indie expanded universe. Whether it be the novels or games like The Fate of Atlantis, nothing is excluded. And they're all bound to be better than this movie. So with that being said, I'm change of plagiarisms. And until next time, what are stories for mystery boxes? Under the mountain.